Hey guys, what's up? This is Stephanie and welcome back to my channel. So in the video today, I'm going to be reviewing the GI track with you guys. So the gastrointestinal topics for your exams. Hopefully this video is helpful for you guys. For those of you who are in your didactic year, so your first year of PA school. Just a little bit about me real quick. I'm currently a, I guess you would say a third year PA student. I already finished all my clinical rotations and I'm currently in my capstone. So not all programs are have a capstone. My program is one of those programs that has a capstone. Basically, a capstone is a three-month rotation where we rotate in an area that we want to specialize in. So I'm going to be doing surgery and ICU where I'm rotating at. So that's where I'm at right now. So I wanted to review these information with you. I already took all my end of rotation exams and I already finished my didactic year. So I've gone through multiple questions, practice questions, and then also the questions that I saw on my exams during my didactic year and my end of rotation exam. So I kind of kind of am very familiar with the buzzwords you're gonna see on your exams or which topics are very, very commonly tested. So hopefully this video is helpful for you guys. I know for my program, they had a tutoring session during didactic year, which really, really helped me out and I went to them. And so for those of you who have, that are attending PA programs that don't, don't have tutoring, hopefully this video is helpful for you guys, okay? So I'm going to go over the topics, and then if you ha see me glancing down, it's because I'm going to be looking at my notes, okay? But I'm going to try not to glance as much, and like I said, I'm going to go over topics. If I keep repeating it over and over again, it's because it's something that's very, very highly tested, okay? So let's start with uh, GI, and then I'm also studying for my pants, so this is going to help me study for my pants. So let's go with GI. Let's start with uh, esophagitis. So what's, what is esophagitis? Esophagitis is an inflammation of the esophagus. The most common cause of esophagitis is going to be gastrointestinal reflux disease, also known as GERD, okay? Other causes are NSAIDs. So if the patient likes to take a lot of ibuprofen, if they have a history of chronic pain, if they are alcoholics, if they have a history of radiation therapy, if they have long-term antibiotic therapy, if they're older, and then of course, if they have malnutrition. So there are different types of esophagitis. So let's discuss each one. Infectious is the most common one. And usually when we think about an infectious cause, we think about three of them, right? With candida albicans being the most common one, okay? So candida albicans, that's like the white that you see in the esophagus. Um, Usually with these patients, whenever we diagnose them with candida, it's going to be white and then you're able to scrape it off. So that's going to be kind of how it'll tell you in the question stem that this patient is presenting with esophagitis um, and you go in there and you see and it's you're able to scrape it off. It's like white. And with these patients, it's going to be more commonly found in patients that have a history of HIV. HIV, so if they're immunocompromised, these patients are more commonly prone to get these type of infections. Also, if the patient has a history of using inhalers, so that's why we really tell our patients uh, who use the steroid inhaler inhalers or inhaled steroids to make sure that they brush their teeth after they use these steroid inhalers or inhaled steroids, sorry guys, because these patients can get this candida albicans. So just make sure that you're familiar with that, how it presents on the question stem. So this another uh, second most common cause is going to be herpes simplex virus. Once again, this is commonly found in patients that are immunocompromised, if they have a history of organ transplant. And then finally, it's going to be uh, cytomegalovirus, CMV. Once again, patients that are immunocompromised or they've had a history of organ transplant, okay? So just make sure that you are familiar with these. In regards to pill esophagitis, this is usually going to be if they've had a contact with some type of medication for a long time. So the most common medications are going to be alendronate, which is a type of biphosphonate. This is why you tell these patients to sit up and drink the medication, but to sit up for 30 minutes, okay? To make sure that they're drinking the medication also with a full glass of water, okay? for your biphosphonates. Also, doxycycline. I was actually reviewing cases the other day, and I saw a case about a child that was presenting with esophagitis, and they, he actually, you could see it that he had like a pill stuck there, and it was uh, doxycycline. So doxycycline is huge when it, in regards to pill esophagitis. 
also your NSAIDs, your aspirin, your potassium chloride, your ferrous sulfate, and iron. But the most commonly ones I saw that were tested were definitely your uh, tetracyclines like doxycycline and then also your biphosphonates, okay, for pale esophagitis. And then we have uh, isinophilic, which is basically with these patients are going to be presenting with a history of allergies, atopic dermatitis, and asthma. And it's due to elevated serum IgE, okay. Usually, you'll see on exam that's going to be stacked circular ring formation, okay? That's going to be with your eosinophilic. So how I memorized it was IgE is associated with eosinophilic, right? Because it has that E. So next one's going to be corrosive. This one's going to be basically found in patients that ingested some type of chemical like Clorox, whether these patients were trying to commit suicide or maybe they have some type of a, a psychiatric issue. So it's going to be usually with corrosive esophagitis. It's an ingestion of strongly acidic or basic chemicals. Like I said, bleach, your detergents. Uh, these patients are going to be presenting with um, uh, suicide attempts. Also children, right? Sometimes children don't do this purposefully. They'll just get into the cabinets and they'll swallow these. And this can cause e uh, esophagitis. So just make sure that you know the difference between them, whether it's an infectious cause. Like I said, the most common one is going to be Candida albicans, it's usually going to present with a white, right? It's usually most commonly found in patients that are immunocompromised. That's going to be the most common one. You're able to actually, like, touch it and it'll come off. And then you also have herpes simplex virus, and then you have also cytomegalovirus, okay? And then, of course, we have our pill, right? Pill esophagitis, most commonly caused by biphosphonates and then doxycycline. And then eosinophilic, with this patient, they're going to have a history of like allergies, your uh, atopic triad. And then we have corrosive, where the patient basically ingested some type of chemical that damaged that mucosa in the esophagus. So how is this patient going to present? They're going to be presenting with trouble swallowing, so your dysphagia. They're going to have painful swallowing, so they're going to have odinophagia. They're going to have retrosternal chest pain. They'll have nausea and vomiting. They'll also be presenting with a cough. They'll have also a lot of reflux with these patients. And then if the patient has a candidiasis, they'll have that oral thrush. And then what if the patient has herpes simplex virus? Where are you going to see? You're going to see your oral ulcers, okay? And then if a patient has pill esophagitis, you're going to have these symptoms after they took the pill. So they're going to feel like they have something stuck there. It's painful to swallow. So... How are you going to diagnose these patients? Basically, we're going to do an endoscopy. So we're going to put a tube down there, okay? We're going to do it with a biopsy and brushings. So if it's due to eosinophilic, remember we said it's due to IgE, it's IgE mediated. We're going to see more than 15 eosinophils, and we're also going to see the IgE increase, okay? So once again, IgE is associated with eosinophilic. If it's due to cytomegalovirus, then we're going to see a single large shallow linear ulcer. And then if it's due to candida, we're going to see, remember, these lesions are going to be well circumscribed and they're going to be creamy longitudinal plaques. And you're actually able to take these plaques off. And then if it's herpes simplex virus, it'll be white lesions with central umbilical clearing. So it'll look like punched out ulcers. Make sure that you know that because that's how they're going to describe it on the question stem. I mean, of course, the history can tell you a lot and usually they'll give it to you when they say it's a patient that's immunocompromised. But sometimes they don't. So if they don't, they'll describe it how I described it and make sure that you know the difference between them. Once again, candida is going to be that creamy white uh, longitudinal plaque. Herpes simplex varius is going to be white lesions that have a central umbilical clearing, punched out ulcers. And then cytomegalovirus is going to be single, large, shallow, and linear ulcers. How are you going to treat these patients? Basically, we're going to treat the re reflex, right? We're going to give them a proton pump inhibitor, inhibit, inhibitor. So what are our PBIs? Our omeprazole is the most common one, the one that you see over the counter. With these patients, we're also going to make sure that we educate them on how to prevent more further inflammation of the esophagus. esophagus. So, of course, we're going to tell them to avoid any spicy foods, acidic foods, avoid alcohol and tobacco, Make sure that they are taking small bites and not eating like huge meals. And then in regards to pill induced, if it's due to pill induced, we want to make sure that we dis tell the patient to discontinue the medication that started the, the pill induced esophagitis. And then of course, 
if possible, we can maybe switch to a liquid formulation and then tell them to take their pills with water and remain upright for 30 minutes. That's huge, okay? And then if it's eisenophilic, we want to make sure that we give them PPIs. We can also give them topical glucocorticoids like budesonide and fluticasone. And then if it's infectious, if it's due to candidiasis, remember you said that's the most common one. So for candidiasis, we're going to do any of our antifungals. So we're going to do something like fluconazole. If it's due to herpes simplex virus, what do we give for herpes simplex virus, right? We usually give our antivirals. So the most common one you're going to see usually for herpes simplex virus, anything that has to do with herpes simplex virus is going to be acyclovir, okay? And then cytomegalovirus, once, or more, once again, the most common medication you're going to see in regards to CMV is going to be gang cyclovir, and that's how you're going to treat these patients with esophagitis, okay? All right, so let's go on to the next one, achalasia. This one's really, really highly tested, so make sure that you know how it presents, what's the pathophysiology of it, and then how it looks on an x-ray. I can tell you I've had so many questions on this, so make sure that you're familiar with this. So achalasia is basically a failure of the lower esophageal sphincter to relax with swallowing and increase lower esophageal tone okay these patients have decreased peristalsis so usually the most common cause is idiopathic okay the second most common cause is going to be adenocarcinoma and then also worldwide it's going to be Chagas disease so remember Chagas disease is that parasitic infection that is carried by the kissing bug it's that kissing bug that comes and basically it'll bite you and then when it bites it like defecates and then you're sleeping, and then you scratch yourself, and you basically auto-inoculate yourself with these parasites. So I'll talk about that later. I love, as you can tell, infectious diseases. So Chagas disease is also a common cause of worldwide achalasia. So how is this patient going to present? So basically, they're going to present with trouble swallowing, and it's going to be progressive, okay? It's going to be progressive dysphagia. And this is how you're going to differentiate between achalasia and something malignant. Because something that is malignant, like esophageal cancer, with these patients, it's going to be usually pretty quick, okay? It's not something progressive. Like, the patient is going to be fine today, and then, like, next week, they're going to have trouble swallowing, like, solids, like, liquids, okay? Versus this one, this one is progressive, so it takes a while to get to that point with achalasia. So they're going to have progressive dysphagia to both solids and liquids. They're going to have regurgitation also, and then these patients... Um, are also going to be presenting with weight loss because the patient doesn't want to eat, right? They can also present with chest pain, okay? And then sometimes these patients can also present with pulmonary complications because they are aspirating their food. So what is going to be our primary diagnostic test for these patients, okay? This is where you also have to make sure that you differentiate achalasia from other ones because I always... Get these confused. So remember we talked about esophagitis, we're going to basically put a scope down their throat versus achalasia with this patient. Our initial one's going to be a barium swallow, okay? This is where we're going to see that bird beak. Bird beak is usually pathognomonic for achalasia. So if it's a patient that's having trouble swallowing and you see that they show you that there's a bird beak, then you want to think about achalasia because they're going to show you a picture, okay? So, and sometimes the question will just be very vague or the vignette. It'll just say a patient that has trouble swallowing and then they'll give you that picture and you're like, okay, it looks like a bird beak. And you're like, okay, it's achalasia. So you're going to see a bird beak, but what's a gold standard for achalasia? So the gold standard is going to be esophageal manometry. And this is where you're going to see that the patient has decreased peristalsis and they have incomplete relaxation of the lower esophageal sphincter. Because remember we said that achalasia is due to failure of the lower esophageal sphincter to relax when the patient is swallowing. Basically, they have an increased tone of that lower esophageal sphincter. So once again, we said the initial one's going to be a barium swallow, but our gold standard is going to be an esophageal manometry. So just make sure that you know what the question's asking. Sometimes they'll trick you with that. Sometimes it, they'll give you a vignette that it says that the patient has achalasia and you're like, okay, I know what it is. And then it tells you, well, what is the next step? Okay, if it's the next step, then you're going to choose something like barium swallow, right? But if it asks you what is the gold standard, then it's going to be an esophageal manometry for these patients. So what's going to be the treatment? Basically, there is no cure for achalasia, okay? 
You're just going to tell the patient to make sure that they're chewing their food well, okay, that they are sleeping elevated. And we can give them some medications, like we can give them some type of anti-muscarinic like dicyclamine. We can give them nitroglycerin or calcium channel blockers like nifedipine. We can also do a Botox injection uh, to the lower esophageal sphincter during endoscopy also. And then if needed, we can do a forceful dilation. Basically, we're going to put a pneumatic balloon in there. And this is actually the most effective one. Surgery is usually going to be like our last resort. But... Like I said, usually with these patients, we're basically just going to tell them to chew the food well, sleep elevated. We can do a Botox injection because remember we said that that lower esophageal sphincter is just like very, very um, increased. It has that increased lower esophageal tone. So it's very, very stiff. That's why this patient is having trouble swallowing. So we're done with achalasia. Make sure that you know with achalasia, these patients have progressive dysphagia to both solids and liquids okay and then with these patients remember that they are going to be on your barium swallow you're going to see what you're going to see a bird's beak okay all right so next one is going to be diffuse esophageal spasm this is usually due to non-peristaltic spontaneous contractions simultaneous and they're all coordinated, but they do have a normal lower esophageal function in comparison to achalasia where they don't. With these patients, uh, usually on the history, you'll see that they'll be very anxious and might have uh, taken some hot or cold liquids. And how is this patient going to present with diffuse esophageal spasm? Basically, they're going to present with chest pain. Uh, sometimes that pain is going to radiate to the neck. They'll have trouble swallowing and they'll have like a globus sensation. If you've ever had that globus sensation, it's like you swallow and you feel like you have something there, but there's, there's something stuck in your throat, but there's nothing there. I've had it before because I have a really bad chronic GERD. So due to my GERD, I get that like globus sensation where you feel like there's something in your throat, but there's mm. not. So this is how this patient's going to present. How are you going to diagnose them? You're going to do a barium swallow. And you're going to see a corkscrew also. You can do also do an endoscope or manometry. And then treatment for these patients is basically going to be with nitrates and calcium channel blockers. Okay. So once again, so diffuse esophageal spasm with these patients, you're going to see what? You're going to see a corkscrew on your barium swallow versus on the barium swallow for achalasia. We're going to see what? We're going to see a bird beak, right? So make sure you know the difference between these because you're going to get a... Like I said, I'll show you a photo. So if it's a bird's beak, it's going to be achalasia. If it's a corkscrew, it's going to be diffuse esophageal spasm. So next one's going to be Zenker diverticulum. With Zenker diverticulum, these patients basically have like an outpouching of the posterior hypopharynx. Okay, so you have an outpouching, and with this outpouching, outpou the patient has regurgitation of undigested food and then usually liquids after eating. And this is usually most commonly found in like older people, especially it's going to be older men with Zenker diverticulum. Okay. And how is the patient going to present? It's usually always says in the vignette that the patient has a progressive, really, really bad breath. Okay. So they're going to present with halitosis. They can also present with uh, trouble swallowing, regurgitating food also. And then the diagnosis is we're going to do a barium swallow, and that's when you see that outpouching. And the treatment for this is usually going to be surgery. We're going to do a cricopharyngeal myotomy, okay? So once again, zincer diverticulum, that's usually due to an outpouching of the posterior hypopharynx. With this patient, they're going to be presenting with a foul, like nasty, like breath, halitosis. It's usually going to be found in an older man. And you're going to do a barium swallow with this patient. Treatment's going to be surgery. So next one we're going to do is esophageal stricture. So this is due to thickening and scarring of the esophagus wall. With these patients, they have dysphagia, but they only have dysphagia to solids, okay? So solids only. So we have different types of esophageal strictures. We have a plumber vinson syn syndrome. Uh, with these patients, basically, they have an upper esophageal web-like tissue. And also with these patients... Um, it's more commonly found in a postmenopausal woman. How is the patient going to present? They're going to present with 
the dysphagia, iron, de iron deficiency, okay? They're also going to have spoon-shaped nails, so your colonicia. They can also have angular colitis, which is, you'll see it usually like on the ends of the mouth right here, it's like white and dry. And also these patients are going to be presenting with heartburn, okay? How are you going to diagnose them? You're going to do an EGD, so you're going to do an endoscope. You can also do a CBC, and that's when you see the patient has microcytic anemia. It's specifically, it's going to be what? Iron deficiency anemia, and you're basically going to treat them with an esophageal balloon dilation with a PPI, and then, of course, you're going to treat the anemia. So usually with Palmer Vincent syndrome, like I said, they're going to present with that anemia, okay? So it's going to be the iron deficiency anemia. They're going to have that dysphagia, trouble swallowing. And it's usually because they have a upper esophageal web-like tissue. Now, let's go into Schottky ring, which is another type of esophageal stricture. With these, they're going to be distal, okay? Distal esophageal webs or tissue rings. So remember we said with Plummer Vincent, it's usually upper esophageal. Well, this one with Schottky ring, it's going to be usually in the distal esophagus, okay? And it'll be in the distal esophagus. You'll see these esophageal webs or tissue ring diaphragm like in the lower esophagus and it's going to be distal once again sometimes it can be accompanied by a sliding hiatal hernia and what are some of the causes of a schottky ring so some of the causes is going to be ingestion of alkali acids so if they ingested any type of chemicals they can have a schottky ring um, if they ingested uh, bleach detergent like these patients that remember we discussed earlier they try to uh, commit suicide or whether the child's uh, it's a child it's a young kid so the patient's going to be presenting with usually intermittent solid food dysphagia and also food impaction our diagnosis is going to be a barium swallow or you can do also an endoscope and treatment's going to be with an esophageal balloon dilation and a ppi as you can tell it's similar to plummer vinson syndrome because these are usually what esophageal structures so just make sure that you know the difference between these. So if we think about it, both Plummer Vinson and Schottky ring, okay? So they are both associated with strictures, right? Plummer Vinson is going to be found proximally. So it's going to be found in the upper esophagus. How you can memorize is that Plummer has a P, proximal has a P, so Plummer Vinson syndrome. And then we have proximal. It's going to be found in the upper esophagus, okay? Usually with these patients, they're going to present with anemia. It's going to be iron deficiency anemia. And with Schottky ring, this is usually in the distal area, right? It's going to be in the distal esophagus. And they're usually going to have, um, with these patients, a history of ingesting some type of chemical like bleach, usually because it was due to a suicide attempt. And the treatment for both of these is that you're going to go in there, you're going to do esophageal balloon dilation. So you're going to dilate the esophagus. And you're also giving PPIs. And of course, you can also do surgery um, for the shot skewing if they necrosed like the entire esophagus. Okay. So next one's gonna be Mallory Weiss tear. This one's very, very highly tested, so make sure that you're familiar with this one. With Mallory Weiss tear, it's usually a mucosal longitudinal tear of the esophagus. And it's usually because a patient has been vomiting for a long time. So it's like this forceful vomiting. And only the mucosa and submucosa is affected. So once again, only the mucosa and submucosa is affected. It's only a tear. It doesn't go through the entire esophagus. Because if you have a, a cut that goes through the entire esophagus, then that's going to be Boerhaave syndrome, which we're going to discuss next. But this one's only the mucosa and submucosa. It's only a tear, okay? It's going to be a patient that has been vomiting. They were partying too hard the previous day. Or sometimes it'll say that the patient has a history of... Uh, being an alcoholic. So with these patients, you're going to be presenting with basically uh, hematemesis. So they're going to have blood in their vomit. They're going to have forceful vomiting with blood. They'll also be presenting with epigastric pain. And like I said, these patients, how are they going to present? It's going to be a patient that's vomiting a lot. Usually, like I said, an alcoholic, a kid that partied too much, even a bulimic patient, okay? If they had food poisoning. You're basically going to diagnose them with an endoscope. And once you do that endoscope, you're going to see that longitudinal tear in the mucosa. 
and treatment's gonna be supportive. So of course, we're gonna do our ABCs, we're gonna check our airway, breathing and circulation. And then after that, uh, we're gonna give in proton pump inhibitors. If we need to admit them, we're gonna admit them. And then if the if there's an active bleeding lesion, then we can do a uh, surgery, okay, with these patients. All right, guys, so next one's going to be our Mallory Weiss tear. So, Ma I'm sorry, we already did Mallory Weiss tear. So, once again, going over Mallory Weiss tear, it's just a tear. So, it's just a longitudinal tear in the esophagus. It only involves a mucosa and some mucosa. Okay, it doesn't go through the entire esophagus. With these patients, they're going to be usually with the history of like forceful, wretched vomiting. They've been vomiting so much, whether the patient was extremely drunk, it was an alcoholic, a bulimic, etc. Versus Borhave, or have, which is going to be the next one. These patients are going to have what a transmural rupture of the esophagus. Okay, and this is because the patient has an increase in intraesophageal pressure. So once again, it's going to be a transmural rupture of the distal esophagus. So it's a complete rupture. Remember we said with Mallory Weiss is just a mucosa and the submucosa. With Borhav, it's going to be a complete rupture of the distal esophagus. The patient's going to be presenting with vomiting, retching. So as you can tell, it's going to be very, very similar to Mallory Weiss. But you just have to know with this patient, they ruptured like Transmoral rupture of the esophagus. These patients are at high risk for having like an upper GI bleed. So this patient's also going to have severe retrosternal chest pain. And something that's unique with this patient is that they're going to have crepitus, crunching, and crackling when you auscultate that area. So they're going to have emphysema, which is that. And usually when you hear this, this crepitus and crunching and crackling when you're auscultating the area, it's known as Hammond's sign, okay? So you might get a question that says you're, they're describing a patient that has bore halves, right? Because you know it's a transmural. It involves the entire esophagus. And then it says what sign is most likely to be seen on this patient. And then that's when you like the hymen sign, right? That crunching sound because they've ruptured their esophagus. And once again, how is the patient going to present? Very similar to Mallory Weiss, vomiting, retching, um, and then what's going to be your diagnosis? So we can start with the chest x-ray. On the chest x-ray, we're going to see a widened uh, mediastinum. We are also going to see emphysema. And we're going to confirm with the CT scan with these patients. Treatment's going to be usually with IV antibiotics. We're going to give them also intravenous uh, PPI. And then, of course, surgical repair. And make sure that we're putting these patients uh, in PO. Okay. Okay, guys, so next one. So our next one's going to be esophageal varices, okay? So esophageal varices are very common in who? So esophageal varices are very common in cirrhotic patients, okay? And esophageal varices are very prone to rupture and cause upward GI bleed. So just make sure that you are familiar with that. So esophageal varices, what are they? It's basically a dilated veins in the distal esophagus that are caused by elevated pressure in the portal veins. So once again, it's commonly found in alcoholics, especially if the patient is cirrhotic. If the liver isn't working anymore, then the blood's going to back up, and that's what causes these esophageal varices, okay? And they're very prone, like I said, to rupture. So the most common cause is going to be what? Once again, cirrhosis, okay? It's due to portal hypertension with these patients. And it's life-threatening because the patient can bleed out, upper GI bleeds. How is the patient going to present? They're going to present with hematemesis. So what is hematemesis, guys? I'm sorry, I keep saying that over and over again. Make sure that you're familiar with your terminology. So hematemesis is when the patient is vomiting and they have bright red blood in their vomit. Whenever you think about hematemesis or whenever you think, exactly, hematemesis, you're thinking about an upper GI bleed, okay? Because if a patient has a low, if it's involving anywhere of the lower GI, like your colon, I mean, the patient's not going to be vomiting bright red blood, okay? So with these patients, if it's bright red blood, we're thinking anything in the upper GI area, okay? So that's what hematemesis. So they're going to have bright red hematemesis. They're also going to have signs of cirrhosis or that they have signs of liver disease. So they'll have the spider angiomas, right? They'll have that ascites, like the big ascites with the fluid wave with these patients. They're also going to be icteric. 
so they can have yellow around the eyes. And how are we going to diagnose esophageal varices? We're basically going to put a scope down there and look at it. Treatment, of course, if it's acute, you want to make sure that we're doing our ABCs, right, or airway breathing and circulation. Uh, we want to make sure that we stabilize the patient, so we're going to give them fluids. And then we can also do an endoscopy, right? We're going to band them, and then we're also going to give them IV octreotide and also IV antibiotics, broad ones, okay? And then if it's chronic, we want to make sure we give them beta blockers, and then we also do variceal ligation with these patients. So once again, esophageal varices common in cirrhotic patients. So on the question stem, they're going to give you a patient that has cirrhosis, they're coming, and they're vomiting alcohol, they're vomiting alcohol, they're vomiting bright red vomit. Usually also on the question stem, it'll say that the patient has a history of drinking. Sometimes it won't even say that the patient has cirrhosis. And then that's, and it'll describe a cirrhotic patient. So it'll say that they have ascites and then they have icterus. And then it tells us that the patient's vomiting red blood. And that's when you're thinking, you know what, maybe this is an esophageal varus, varicy that ruptured. And you have to make sure how to treat the patient. Okay, guys, so next one is going to be gastroesophageal reflux disease. That's what I have. It's also known as heartburn. I always tell my parents I have GERD, and then they look at me like, what are you talking about? So if I say heartburn, they're like, okay, I know what you're talking about. So it's so known as heartburn. So with the, the common cause of gastroesophageal reflux disease is because there's an inappropriate relaxation of a lower esophageal sphincter. So we have the esophagus, right? And then once we go to the esophagus, we have like this kind of like door, and that's a lower esophageal sphincter. And then the, we have the stomach. So that little door right there basically is not, is, it's used and the purpose of it is to not allow acid go back up in the esophagus because the stomach is very, very acidic, right? The pH is very, very acidic. The stomach, the stomach, the tissue in the stomach is prepared to handle all that acid, but the tissue in the esophagus is not prepared to handle all that acid. So when that door there, that's this is how my pedi, uh, pediatrician that I was with described it to a patient. And ever since I heard that, I thought it was amazing. So this is why I'm telling you guys, this is how he described it. And it's a fantastic way to put it in your head and visualize it. So when that door is basically not closing properly, appropriately, and is not working, this is where you get that reflex. So you're getting all that acid that is going back into the esophagus and this is what's causing that heartburn, that burning sensation, that sour taste in your mouth. So it's due to, once again, inappropriate relaxation of the lower esophageal sphincter. You have retrograde flow of stomach contents for these patients. So usually with these patients, how are they going to present? Uh, they're going to be presenting with a nocturnal cough. So when I did my ENT rotation, so my ears, nose, throat rotation, if we had patients that presented with like sore throat or cough, we always made sure that we had asked them if they have a history of acid reflux or if they have heartburn. Because these patients that have acid reflux and it's been going on for a long time, they can present with hoarseness and they can also present with a cough. And it's just a dry cough. It's not productive, just a dry, constant cough and sore throat and this hoarseness. So this is why we always make sure that you ask these questions and they can trick you like them, the questions that you're reading. It says that it has a cough, sore throat, and it sounds like maybe something respiratory, but make sure that you also rule out GERD, okay? Because GERD can cause these symptoms also with these patients. So with these patients also, some of the risk factors that they have is, is for patients to develop GERD is if they have hiatal hernia, that's actually the most common one. Last week during my family medicine rotation that I finished, we had a patient that had like chronic GERD. It was so bad that she had to get her teeth, like she had to get new teeth because it had degraded all her teeth. And she was young, she was like 34. It had degraded all her teeth. And her teeth, she said they were falling out. Like they were just, she said that she described it like they were just like falling off. And it was just, and that's like my fear because I have GERD, like I said. And she just, and that's what she has. She has a hiatal hernia. So they're thinking about doing surgery because it affected all her teeth and she need, needed to get new teeth. So hiatal hernia is a common cause of GERD. Also, you know, the diet of the patient. If the patient is not eating healthy, if they smoke, if they drink alcohol, that's huge. 
Also, if the patient is obese, okay, so the more pressure you have on your stomach and your esophagus, it's going to cause that reflux, okay? And then also in pregnancy, which is similar to obesity, they have a lot of pressures. So that's why they, they're, they're causing that, they're having that reflux. So once again, how's the patient going to present? They're going to have retrosternal pain that radiates upwards. It's going to be worse after eating and with lying down. They're going to have regurgitation. We discussed, remember, the coughs, their sore throat. They'll have dyspepsia also. And how are we going to diagnose these patients? It's usually a clinical diagnosis. We usually do a trial of PPIs and see if they get better with that. But the test of choice is going to be an endoscopy with biopsy. But, of course, we don't do that in clinic. And this is where your book and your clinic differ. Just make sure that you read whatever is in your book because that's what you're going to get tested on. Okay? And then <clears throat> the gold standard is going to be 24-hour pH monitoring. So once again, the gold standard is going to be 24-hour pH monitoring. So what's going to be the treatment for these patients? So the treatment is always going to be lifestyle changes, okay? So for most of the questions for your for a disease on your exams, it's going to be lifestyle changes, okay? So just make sure that you always choose it as a first line because it's lifestyle choice changes, especially for GERD. So you're going to tell the patient to avoid fatty foods, coffee, alcohol, and avoid anything that's acidic. Also, um, even tomatoes, they say, chocolate. I love chocolate. Make sure that they're not eating large meals before they go to sleep or before they go to sleep or take a nap or anything during the day. Make sure to avoid those large meals. And to be honest with you guys, sometimes I get home late, like during my rotations. I would get home like at nine. And sometimes, especially like during my surgery rotation where I didn't get a break. I didn't get to eat, I would come home starving and then I would eat and I would try to stay awake because I knew if I fell asleep with my stomach full when I had just eaten, I would have such bad heartburn. And so that's why it's really important you tell these patients to not to eat before they go to sleep or not eat big meals before they go to sleep. Also, another thing that you can do is that you can tell them to sleep with the trunk elevated, so the head of the bed elevated. So that patient I was discussing earlier that has like a really severe case of gastroesophageal reflux disease, she says she actually purchased a special bed that helps her sleep with the head of the bed elevated. And also, of course, tell the patient to stop smoking and then if they're overweight, to lose weight. So once again, that's going to be our lifestyle changes, right? If the patients try lifestyle changes, which is sometimes in the question stem, It'll say this patient has worked out, they've exercised, and they're still having these refractory symptoms. And that's where you're going to uh, think about medications. So our initial one, textbook-wise, is going to be your H2 blockers, okay? Your semetidine, your renitidine. So your H2 blockers, that's going to be first line or antacids. Textbook-wise, now in clinic, we don't do that. We usually start the patient on a PPI because PPIs are more superior than your H2, Okay. But since we're talking about the book, we're, your textbook, and that's what they're going to test you on, it's going to be your H2, okay? So once again, first uh, pharmacological treatment, if they need it, you're going to start with a H2 blocker. And then after that, the patient's not responding to antacids or H2 blockers, then you're going to add a PPI like omeprazole, uh, pantoprazole, anything that ends in your prazole, esomeprazole. So... What if the patients try lifestyle changes, you put them on the H2 blockers, they're still not getting better with the GERD, and then you put them on a PPI and the patient's still not getting better with the GERD, what are you going to do? You're going to do surgery. So you're going to do a lap Neeson fundoplication, okay? This is like last resort. The patient is just refractory. They're not responding to lifestyle, like I said, to medications, pharmacological treatment. And that's until you do a lap Neeson fundoplication, Okay. So what are some of the complications of gastroesophageal reflux disease and why I'm like scared about GERD is that it can cause a lot of things. So it can cause esophageal ulcers, okay? These esophageal ulcers can sometimes uh, perforate, patient can get a GI bleed. The one that you're very scared of is going to be Barrett's esophagus. So Barrett's esophagus can lead to esophageal cancer, which we're actually going to discuss after this, but Barrett's esophagus, make sure that you know that, okay? It can lead to Barrett's esophagus. Barrett's esophagus is basically when you have a metaplasia of the esophagus. So you have different tissues in your stomach, and then you have different tissues in your esophagus. 
like I said, the tissue that's made in the stomach is basically, they're prepared for that acidic environment, but the tissue in the esophagus is not. So if you're getting that reflux in the esophagus over and over again, it's going to be da damaging that tissue, okay? And it's going to basically make the tissue and convert it from squamous epithelial to columnar, okay? So once again, it's going to convert it from your squamous cells to your columnar cells. And this can progress to cancer. So that's why in these patients that present with this, with a uh, GERD, we want to make sure that they don't progress to Barrett's. And if they do have Barrett's, we want to make sure that we take care of the Barrett's so it doesn't progress to esophageal cancer. Okay. And then other causes, complications is going to be pitting of the dental enamel. So like remember I discussed it with the patient that I had, it can ruin your teeth because you're having that acid like reflux. You get that sour taste and you get the sensitivity in your teeth. Okay, guys, so let's go into gastric disorders, okay? So gastric disorder is anything that involves the stomach. So we have gastritis. Gastritis is basically an inflammation of the gastric mucosa. We have different types. We have type A that involves the body and then type B that involves the antrum of the stomach. Usually it can be acute or chronic, but chronic is the most common one that we see with gastritis. The most common cause usually of gastritis is going to be what? H. pylori, okay? So H. pylori, helicobacter pylori, is a bacterial infection. Other causes are, for example, NSAID use. So if it says in the somewhere in the vignette that the patient has like uh, chronic pain and they use a lot of NSAIDs, you want to think about maybe with gastritis, if they're presenting with gastritis symptoms. Also alcohol use. It can also be autoimmune. Also if their patient has Crohn's or sarcoidosis. How is the patient going to present? Basically, this patient's going to be presenting with dyspepsia. They'll have anorexia. They'll have that epigastric pain. They also can have nausea and vomiting, GI bleed, belching, and then acid reflux. So, diagnosis. What are you going to do for these patients? Basically, we can do a CBC. You're going to see uh, leukocytosis. You're also going to see that the patient has decreased vitamin B12, which makes sense, right? Because the patient isn't able to absorb vitamins and nutrients. And then these patients can also present with, um, you can, another thing you can do is a stool culture, okay? We can do a stool culture to look for H. pylori because we said, what is the most common cause of gastritis? H. pylori. What's the most common cause of chronic gastritis? H. pylori. So helicobacter pylori. So we're going to test for pylori. You can also do your breath test, so your ureus breath test to check for uh, helicobacter pylori. Just make sure that you know that you can't do a um, ureus breath test in a patient that has been on antacids or PPIs for the past two weeks. So like during my family medicine rotation, um, what my doctor did is that he did a lot of the like, stool antigen tests because most of these patients were on PPIs or they were on some type of acid, and sometimes it'll give you like a false negative. So just make sure if you do do the ureus breath test, the patient is off proton pump inhibitors or any type of acid, anti-acids, okay? So use, what is the most accurate test for these patients? You can do an endoscope, um, endoscope exam, so you can do an EGD uh, and then you can biopsy and then see if the patient has H. pylori. That's like the most, um, that's going to be the most like accurate one. But of course we don't, we don't do that because it's invasive. We try to avoid anything that is invasive. So how are we going to treat these patients? Basically, we're going to treat them for their symptoms. And if we know what the cause is and we want to make sure that we eradicate it. So like we said, the most common cause is going to be helicobacter pylori. And if we test a patient, they're positive for H. pylori, how are you going to treat them? Remember, what is the treatment for H. pylori? This is very highly, highly tested. So you have to make sure that you know this. So we have the, the antibiotic treatment. So we have the PPI, and you're going to give them clarithromycin and amoxicillin for these patients, okay? If they have uh, gastritis, that's due to H. pylori. Other treatment that you can give these patients is that of course, like we said, it, it's going to be symptomatic treatment. We're going to give them our PPIs, or H2. We're going to give them um, anti-emetic if the patient is presented with like nausea and vomiting. Make sure that they're drinking a lot of fluids also. 
And then if it's due to like NSAIDs, then tell them to stop taking NSAIDs. If it's because of alcohol, tell them to stop making, uh, taking alcohol and to make sure that they change their diet also. Okay. All right, guys, so that was gastritis. Now we're going to go with peptic ulcer disease. So this is the most common cause of upper GI bleeds is a peptic ulcer, peptic ulcer disease. And this is because there's impaired mucosal defense and acidic gastric content. Basically, there is an acid hypersecretion. The most common cause is going to be what? Helicobacter pylori, I want some more. That's going to be the most common cause. The patient's going to be presenting with increased acid secretions. They're going to have basically um, decreased protective factors or mucus production. Um, sometimes other causes of peptic ulcer disease can be NSAIDs. Why NSAIDs? Because NSAIDs, what they do is that they decrease the prostaglandins. And then also if the patient has like some type of tumor, like Zollinger-Ellison tumor, which is this tumor that just like produces a lot of acid. And that's why these patients can present with peptic ulcer disease. If the patient's stressed out also can be some of the causes uh, of peptic ulcer disease. Their diet, like we mentioned earlier, if they're drinking, coffee, smoking. So make sure that you know the difference between a gastric ulcer and then a duodenal ulcer, Okay. You, this is like very, very highly tested. And how you're going to know is that you're reading the vignette and you're like, okay, this patient has an ulcer and it says that the patient presents with pain that is better with food. So patient has pain, epigastric pain, and then they eat food and it feels a lot better. So which type of, where is it located? Is it gastric or is it duodenal? So how I memorize it is that dude, give me food. So dude, duodenal, the pain gets better when they eat, okay? Duodenal, dude, give me food. Gastric, the pain does not get better with food, okay? So hopefully that's that helps you. So once again, gastric ulcer is gonna be worse with food, okay? Usually with these patients, you're gonna be presenting with weight loss, and these are actually more likely to become malignant, and it's more commonly found in patients that are older with your gastric ulcers. Versus our duodenal ulcers, this is the most common type. And like I said, dude, give me food. This one's going to be pain relieved with eating. And these patients are going to be presenting with weight gain. This is usually found in younger patients, okay? So remember, dude, give me food. Younger patients, duodenal ulcers, pain relieves with food. And you have your gastric ulcers where the patient has uh, basically worsening of pain with food and is more commonly found in older patients patients. And then we have our stress ulcers, like our crawling ulcer, which is basically common in patients that have severe burns. So how is the patient with the ulcer disease, peptic ulcer disease, going to present? So in general, they're going to be presenting with epigastric pain. Like I said, it's going to be like aching and gnawing. They'll have also dyspepsia. They'll have symptoms at night. They're also going to be presenting with nausea and vomiting, weight loss because they don't want to eat because it's painful. Early satiety, um, if it's perforated, because like I said, this is the most common cause of upper GI bleeds, they're going to be presenting with right shoulder pain, and they're also going to have um, rebound tenderness to palpation. So how are you going to diagnose these patients? So we said, what is the most common cause of peptic ulcer disease? H. pylori. So we want to make sure that we rule out H. pylori. So we can do a urea breath test or a fecal antigen test to make sure that we rule out um, H. pylori. And then the most accurate one, though, is going to be basically a scope. So you're going to do uh, EGD. You're going to scope him. You're going to do a biopsy just to make sure that it's not anything related with cancer. So what's going to be the treatment for these patients? So if the patient has been taking chronically NSAIDs, and this is what's causing their peptic ulcer disease, we're basically going to tell them to discontinue their NSAIDs and their aspirin, to stop taking alcohol if it's alcohol that they're consuming a lot and it's causing this peptic ulcer disease to stop smoking, to decrease their stress also. You can also give them like PPIs to decrease that acid. And then remember if we said if it's due to H. pylori, what's going to be the treatment? It's going to be your PPI, so omeprazole, pantoprazole, any of your PPIs, plus clarithromycin, plus amoxicillin, okay? There's also the quadruple therapy. Um, which is going to be your proton pump inhibitor, your bismuth salicylate, also known as your Pepto-Bismol, uh, metronidazole, and tetracycline for these patients. Okay, the most common complication is going to be what for the for peptic ulcer disease? We said bleeding, right? It's the most common cause of upper GI bleed. 
So what if the peptic ulcer has ruptured? It's causing this upper GI bleed. How are we going to treat these patients? We're basically going to give them IV antibiotics and PPI before they go to surgery and they have to surgically repair these. So that was peptic ulcer disease. Make sure that you know the difference between your um, duodenal, right, and your gastric. We said that uh, duodenal is going to be most common. Gastric is usually mostly associated with malignancies. Gastric is more commonly found in elderly. Gastric, it's going to be uh, worse with food. D, dude, give me food. Duodenal is going to be better with food. Most commonly found in younger individuals, and it's the most common one out of the two types of peptic ulcer disease. Okay, guys, next one's going to be pyloric stenosis. So pyloric stenosis is very commonly found in children, okay? During your end of rotation exams, you're definitely going to also have a question on uh, pyloric stenosis for your pediatrics EOR. So make sure that you're very familiar with this. How is a patient or what is the cause of pyloric stenosis? Basically, there's a hypertrophy, a muscular layer of pylorus that presents in the first month of life. It usually results in gastric outlet syndrome. Usually, it's more commonly found in like little infants. Usually, if they are between two weeks to two months, it's more commonly found in males, especially firstborns. So make sure that you know that males, firstborns, it's going to be infants. And usually, it increases if the parent has a family history. Okay. Also, what type of antibiotic can cause pyloric stenosis? Erythromycin. So make sure that you know that erythromycins, or sometimes it'll just say your um, <clears throat> your macrolides. So macrolide antibiotics associated with pyloric stenosis in infants, okay? Erythromycin. So how is the patient going to present? They're basically going to have projectile vomiting, like literally like that vomit that it'll hit the wall, okay? So it's going to be projectile vomiting after feeding. And then these patients are going to be so hungry, so like they vomit and the child just wants to like eat, like suckle, because they're just so hungry. They're not able to pass anything because of that hypertrophy of the muscle wall. So they have that hypertrophy and food isn't able to pass through. That's why they have that projectile vomiting. Okay. They're very hungry. It's going to basically be a very, very hungry baby. And since these patients are vomiting a lot, they're going to be also um, dehydrated. So what are you going to see on physical exam? You're going to see an olive-like mass. So make sure that you know that. An olive-like mass on your pyloric stenosis. Okay? Olive-like mass. How are you going to diagnose these patients? Basically, you're going to do an ultrasound, right? Because they're infants. We want to do the least invasive tests that we can. We're not going to go and do an MRI or CT scan because that's a lot of radiation. So we're going to do an abdominal ultrasound. We're going to see a mushroom. Or sometimes it'll say a string sign or a target lesion, okay? And also, on these patients, make sure that you know how their labs are going to present. Since these patients, these babies are vomiting a lot, okay? What is associated with vomiting? It's going to be what? Metabolic alkalosis. So they're going to be metabolic alkalotic. They're going to have hypokalemia and hypochloremia. So... That's why you have to make sure that you are also giving these babies IV fluids because these patients, these babies are going to be dehydrated. Their electrolytes are going to be like all wacky. They're going to be what? Metabolic alkalotic. They're going to be what? Hypokalemic, hypochloremic. I've had so many questions on these, so make sure that you know this. It'll basically say it's a baby. You're like, okay, I know. And it's that olive mass, that projectile hit the wall vomiting. You're like, okay, I know what it is. And then it says, you get to the question and it says, well, how is this, how, what would you expect in this patient's labs? And you're like, mm. so it's going to be metabolic alkalosis, hypochloremia, and hypokalemia, right? We're going to diagnose them with an abdominal ultrasound. What's going to be our treatment? The first thing that we want to do is that we want to make sure that we're hydrating these babies, okay? We want to make sure that we are taking care of their electrolyte imbalances, replacing those electrolytes, okay? So we're going to give them fluids. We're going to replace their potassium, and then after that, we can do the surgical consult. So they're going to need a pyloromyotomy, okay? Pyloromyotomy with these babies. Okay, so let's go into Zollinger-Ellison syndrome. So Zollinger-Ellison syndrome is due to a gastrinoma. It's basically a gastrin hypersecretion that results in severe acid peptic ulcer disease and diarrhea. So like I said, this is basically like a tumor that you have that is just secreting so much acid. 
So it's when these patients that have gastroesophageal reflux disease, peptic ulcer disease, and you've treated them, and they keep having this acid hypersecretion, you've treated with PPIs, you've done everything, you want to make sure that you rule out things like Zollinger-Ellison syndrome. So pathophysiology, basically they have increased gastrin, which causes stimulation of parietal cells. It causes increased secretion of gastric acid that leads to peptic ulcer disease. Also, this causes a decrease in the pH in the stomach. So that's why these patients are going to have this very, very acidic environment in their stomach. And since they have decreased pH, this is going to inactivate pancreatic enzymes. And these enzymes cannot emulsify fat. So malabsorption is going to occur like diarrhea and steatorrhea. It's more commonly found in men and then also men like males. Also, it's very commonly associated with MEN1, so multiple endocrine neoplasia. One, make sure that you know this, uh, Zoninger Ellison is very common in MEN1, and it's more commonly found in the duodenum. It's also found in the pancreas, but more commonly found in the duodenum. With these patients, you're going to be presenting with abdominal pain, heartburn, weight loss. They'll have malabsorption. They can also be presenting with a GI bleed, right, if they have a peptic ulcer that perforated diarrhea and steatorrhea. Whenever we think about steatorrhea, we want to think about basically some type of malabsorption going on, right? How are we going to diagnose this patient? We're going to start with an endoscope, so we're going to put a scope down there and see if uh, what's going on. But basically, our confirmatory test is going to be an increased serum gastrin concentration, and it's going to be increased, okay? And it's usually going to be done um, fasting. And how are we going to treat this patient? Basically, we're going to control the acid secretion. We're going to do this with PPIs or octreotide. We can also do surgical treatment, which is going to be with an exploratory laparoscopy and resection also. If it's metastatic, then we want to do chemotherapy. So gastroparesis. Gastroparesis is a syndrome of objectively delayed gastric emptying and the absence of a mechanical obstruction. Basically, these patients have decreased peristalsis. Okay, The most common cause is usually idiopathic. Um, diabetes mellitus also typically found in patients that are greater than five years if they've been having diabetes for more than five years. Uh, also usually associated with uh, post-surgery. Okay, How are these patients going to present? They're going to present with nausea, vomiting, early satiety, bloating, upper abdominal pain, also postprandial fullness, weight loss, which is going to be severe. Symptoms are going to be worse after food intake and diagnosis initial. We want to do an upper endoscopy. Okay. We want to make sure that there's no obstruction or mass that's causing this uh, delayed gastric emptying. We want to confirm with the scintigraphic cint- gastric emptying study. Treatment's going to be basically dietary modifications. We're going to tell the patient to avoid foods that are spicy, fatty, avoid alcohol, smoking. And of course, if the patient's diabetic, we want to make sure that they have their diabetes controlled and that they're properly hydrated. So what's going to be the first line treatment for this? We want to give them something that's going to help with the movement, right? So we can give them something like uh, metoclopramide. That's going to be first line for these patients. It's going to increase that contractility because with these patients, what do they have? They have absence of, um, they have delayed gastric emptying. They have decreased or absence of peristalsis. So we want to make sure that we give them something that's going to help that food move down. Okay. Also, we can give them antiemetics like diphenhydramine and undansetran, right? And then uh, if we've given all these treatments and it's still not being treated, then we can give something, we can do surgery, okay? But these are usually like last line ones again. So that's going to be gastroparesis, okay? The patient's going to be presenting with nausea, vomiting, bloating, upper abdominal pain, postprandial fullness, and then weight loss, which is going to be severe, And that's basically because they have delayed gastric emptying. The food is not moving through. All right, guys. So next one's going to be hiatal hernia, okay? Hiatal hernia. So hiatal hernia is basically a protrusion of the upper portion of the stomach into the thoracic cavity due to diaphragm tear or weakness, okay? So the most common type is going to be sliding. There's different types and the most common type is going to be sliding, okay? There's also parasophageal, but sliding is going to be the most common type. How is this patient going to present with these hernias? 
they may be asymptomatic, but if they do have symptoms, they're going to have dysphagia, so trouble swallowing, um, heartburn, chest pain. They're going to be full very soon, so early satiety. We're going to diagnose this with a barium swallow. We can also do an x-ray, an upper GI series, and we're going to see stomach contacts in the thoracic. And then we can also do an upper endoscopy. Treatment is usually going to be with antacids, educating on the patient to make sure that they're taking small meals. We want to make sure that the patient's elevating their head after meals, tell them to lose weight. And then finally, if they've tried all that and they're still being symptomatic, we're going to do surgery, okay? So it's going to be the Nissen fundoplication for these patients. So we finished already gastric disorders. One thing I do want to go over is H. pylori. So H. pylori is very, very highly tested. So make sure that you know how to treat it and what it's associated with. So just to go over it real quick, H. pylori, also known as Helicobacter pylori, is a bacteria. It is commonly associated with gastritis. It's associated with our peptic ulcer disease, right? Our ulcers or gastric and duodenal ulcers. It's also, also associated with gastric cancer. So chronic uh, H. pylori that's not treated is associated with gastric cancer. And how are we going to diagnose this? So basically, we can do a urea breath test, but we can also do the fecal antigen test. So remember, we can't do the urea breath test if the patient has been on PPIs or any type of anti-acid for two weeks. We cannot do a urea breath test because this is going to uh, be a false negative. So usually if a patient is on PPIs or, for example, they're taking antacids for their heartburn, then in these patients, we want to do a fecal antigen test, right? And then in regards to treatment, we have the quadruple therapy, right? And we also have the triple therapy. So for the triple therapy, it's in a PPI. So omeprazole, pentoprazole, any of your PPIs, plus amoxicillin and clarithromycin, okay? Now, what about a quadruple therapy? With quadruple therapy with these patients, you're going to give them bismuth, okay, bismuth salicylate, your peptobismol. You're going to give them uh, metronidazole. You're also going to give them a tetracycline and then omeprazole or any other PPI, okay? So that was H. pylori. All right, guys, so let's go into our small intestine disorders. So let's talk about small bowel obstruction. This is basically an interruption of the normal bowel contents because there's some type of mechanical obstruction that is obstructing. So the most common cause of the most common cause of small bowel obstruction is going to be what? Surgical adhesions. Okay, that's going to be the most common cause. Other causes are hernias. Uh, if the patient has any type of malignancy, like a tumor, intussusception, Crohn's disease, a foreign body. But the most common cause for small bowel obstruction is surgical adhesion. So that's why in these questions you want to see if the patient has a history of having some type of like abdominal surgery. How is this patient going to present? They're going to be presenting with abdominal pain, cramping, nausea, and vomiting. They'll have obstipation. So obstipation is basically where the patient cannot pass any gas. Uh, they'll also have abdominal distension, and they're going to have high-pitched bowel sounds, right? Because the bowel, in the bowel, the food's trying to get through, and it can't because there's some type of obstruction there. So... With these patients, how are we going to diagnose them? We're basically going to do, we can do an x-ray. On that x-ray, you're going to see a ladder pattern. You're going to see proximal dilated loops with like very, very minimal gas passing by. You can do a barium enema also. And then also on your upper GI series, you're going to see a string of pearls for our small bowel obstruction. Treatment is basically we want to give them IV fluids and with electrolytes since most of these patients are going to be what? They're going to be vomiting, right? And like we discussed with our pyloric stenosis, with these patients that are vomiting, they're prone to having metabolic alkalosis, they're prone to having electrolyte disorders. So that's why we want to make sure that we're replacing all of this fluid that they're losing. We also want to do an NG tube. So we want to go in there and make sure that we're emptying their stomach. We want to give them nothing by mouth. We want to give them um, IV pain medication and antibiotics. And then we can do surgery. So surgery we do if this small bowel obstruction is not being treated, it's persistent, or if we think that there's some type of strangulation, because remember we discussed that hernias is also a common cause of small bowel obstruction. So if they have strangulation, like fever, severe pain, they're vomiting blood, this is where the word hematemesis comes into play, shock. Um, they have gas in the bowel wall or portal veins, 
they have some signs of peritoneal signs. Then in these cases, we want to make sure that we do surgery. We would do a laparotomy with lysis of adhesions and resection of the necrotic bowel. So once again, small bowel obstruction, the most common cause is going to be what? It's going to be surgical adhesions, right? It's going to be the most common cause. These patients are going to be presenting with like vomiting, okay? They're going to have obstipation where they basically cannot pass anything, which makes uh, sense, right? They're not able to pass gas, feces, or anything. So next one's going to be intussusception. So intussusception is basically like telescoping, okay? It's an invagination of part of the intestine into itself, okay? So you have your intestine, it invaginates into itself. It's most commonly found in children, um, especially younger children if they're less than two years old. And usually if we think about some type of intestinal obstruction in children, which is not very common, we want to think about intussusception. So how is this patient going to present? This patient is going to present with acute abdominal pain. This is pathognomonic for intussusception, so make sure you know this. You're going to feel a palpable sausage mass, okay? So sausage mass, which makes sense, right? Because that intestine is telescoping. So you're going to feel a palpable sausage mass. You're going to see current jelly stools, okay? It's funny because we think about peanut butter and jelly, right? So these, these stools, they look like current jelly. Another way I've seen this described is that it's mixed with like blood and pus. Uh, the, the pants now is trying to get away from basically key words that are associated with certain disorders, so now they're more descriptive. So sometimes in some of the questions, they won't say that it is current jelly. I'm sorry, that it is um, basically, yeah, current jelly stool. What they're going to say is that it's like a bloody pus stool. So just make sure that you're familiar with both of them, okay? Also, the pain is going to be episodic. It's not going to be constant, which makes sense, right? Because the food is trying to pass by. When it passes by, the baby starts crying, and then after that, they're better. And then the, once again, they have another bowel movement, and they start crying, and then it gets better, right? Because they're having that imagination. So it's going to be episodic with these babies. They're going to be crying, okay? Usually, the little baby's going to be with their knees on their abdomen because there's so much pain and so much pain, and they're not eating either. So how are we going to diagnose these patients? We want to make sure that we do an ultrasound. Remember, with babies, we want to make sure that we are decreasing their exposure to x-rays. So what are we gonna see on this ultrasound? So on this ultrasound, we are going to see the target sign, okay? Target sign. And the best confirmatory test is gonna be with an barium or contrast enema. Treatment for these patients, if they're stable, it's gonna be IV fluids. We're gonna do an NG tube and we're gonna reduce that intussusception. It's gonna be done via pneumatic enema. So that's why the enema is both diagnostic and therapeutic. So once again, with these patients, if with intussusception, how are they going to present? It's usually going to be an infant, 6 to 36 months old. So they're going to be like young children or um, infants. They're going to be presenting with that palpable sausage-shaped mass, right? Intussusception is basically that telescoping of the intestine, okay? They're going to be presenting with current jelly stools. It can also be described as a mucus bloody stool. We are going to diagnose them with an ultrasound. We're going to do a target sign. That's the best initial one. The best confirmatory one is going to be a barium or contrast enema. This is usually both therapeutic and diagnostic. And then the treatment, one, like we said, it's going to be a pneumatic enema. Okay. All right. Next one's going to be volvulus. Volvulus is literally like the twisting of the bowel, malrotation or twisting of the bowel, okay? It's more commonly found in newborns. So 60% of these patients are going to present, are going to be newborns. They're going to be less than one month. So these patients are going to be presenting with bilious vomiting, okay? So that's how you kind of also differentiate between these disorders. So it's going to be bilious. It's going to be that green, like, vomit, acidic vomit. They're also going to be presenting with distension, bloating, okay? They can also have blood streak stools, uh, melina, hematochoesia. They're gonna be dehydrated. How are we gonna diagnose these patients? So we're gonna if, do an x-ray. On the x-ray, you're gonna see the double bubble sign, okay? 
And usually the upper GI contrast enema is going to be critical for diagnosing these patients. So how are, how are they how are we going to see them? So basically, like we said, they're going to have that double bubble sign on the abdominal x-ray. Treatment's going to be with emergent surgical consult because when that bowel is twisted, okay, it can become necrotic and they can lose bowel. So we want to make sure that we're saving that bowel, bowel that intestine, and we want to make sure that we get surgical consult immediately, okay? We can also do decompression or LADS procedure, which is basically where we resect the dead bowel for these patients, and they're usually admitted. So next one's going to be paralytic ileus, which is a decrease or absent peristalsis. They have no mechanical obstruction that is present with these patients. Uh, some of the causes are going to be usually after they had like surgery, if they're uh, if they gave them like opioids or narcotics, that's, this can cause paralytic. Ileus. Also, if the patient's taking like antidepressants, anticholinergics, and then also if they have some type of spinal cord injury. Another common cause is hypokalemia. So once again, paralytic ileus is associated with hypokalemia. Okay, so you want to think about that also. How is the patient going to present? They're going to be presenting with distension, nausea, and vomiting, obstipation. They'll have minimal or absent abdominal pain absent or decreased bowel sounds, bowel sounds also. We're going to diagnose them with an abdominal x-ray. We're going to see basically uniform distribution of gas, failure to pass contrast medium beyond fixed point, and treatment's going to be with IV fluids, nothing by mouth. We want to make sure that we correct all the electrolytes because like we said, patients that are vomiting have what? Metabolic alkalosis and we're prone to electrolyte disorder. So our patients that have diarrhea. So with these patients, most of them are going to be dehydrated if they're vomiting, and we want to make sure that we're replacing their electrolytes, and then we are also giving them fluids. We're also going to do NG suction, and usually it tends to go away by itself, and surgery is usually not needed for these patients. Next one's going to be acute appendicitis. This is very, very commonly tested, so make sure that you are very familiar with acute appendicitis. Also, make sure that you know how to diagnose it, not only for your exams, but in clinic, okay? So... Acute appendicitis is basically an inflammation of the appendix. It's usually caused by an obstruction of the lumen that leads to stasis and bacterial growth. Remember that whenever we have stasis of anything, we get bacteria. So, for example, urinary tract infections, you have that stasis of the urine. That's why they tell you not to hold your urine. That stasis is like a great environment for bacteria. Same with appendicitis, Okay. Usually there's some, some type of obstruction, it causes stasis, causes bacteria, and it can be so bad that it can perforate and it can cause something like peritonitis. The patient can become septic. So that's why appendicitis is an emergency room. Emergency. So appendicitis is more commonly found in males than females. The ages tend to be between 10 to 30 years old. And there are numerous causes for appendicitis. So usually with children, the most common cause is going to be lymphoid hyperplasia. So they have a hyperplasia of the tissue that's obstructing basically that um, the appendix. But in adults, the mo most common cause is a fecalis. So a piece of poop gets stuck there and it's obstructing the appendix. And that's why it's causing that inflammation of the appendix. Other causes are like not very common causes or like seeds. Um, pinworm infections also, or like any type of parasites, I mean, that's really gross, right? So what are, com what are the symptoms? So the patient's going to be presenting with right lower quadrant pain, okay? So they're going to be presenting with right lower quadrant pain. Make sure that you're also familiar with your abdominal quadrants because it can tell you a lot of what the diagnosis is. So right lower quadrant, we're thinking about appendicitis, periumbilical pain, we're thinking about maybe appendicitis. So this patient is going to be presenting with right lower quadrant pain. They're going to be anorexic. They're not going to want to be want to eat. So if those patients that you know that they love to eat and they eat a lot and then all of a sudden they're not eating at all, then you want to think maybe appendicitis, especially if they're presenting with the right lower quadrant pain. They can also present with uh, nausea and vomiting, okay? Nausea and vomiting. So usually with this pain, it starts in the epigastrium, it moves towards the umbilicus, and then it moves to the right lower quadrant pain. So don't be mistaken if you have a patient that comes in and it says that they have umbilical pain, 
and then it moved to the right lower quadrant pane. Think about um, uh, appendicitis because it will migrate. Now, another thing that I wanted to discuss also is that for textbook wise, just make sure you know it's a right lower quadrant pane, right? But it doesn't always present in the right lower quadrant pane for clinic. So just make sure that you know that. But textbook wise, it's going to present in the right lower quadrant area for appendicitis. So make sure that you're also familiar with your Rothstein sign, your SOA sign, your obturator sign, okay? Because they're going to describe the sign for you and you have to know which one it is. So Rothstein sign is where you palpate on the left lower quadrant pane and they're going to have pain on the right lower quadrant pane. If they have that, that's a positive sign for appendicitis, okay? The other sign is going to be your SOA sign. Your psoas sign is basically you're going to have them raise your leg and you're going to push uh, resistance and that's going to basically pull that psoas muscle and it's going to be positive if they have pain from that, okay? So they're going to go like this with their legs, you're going to pull resistance on their leg and they're going to have pain, um, they're going to have pain with this, okay? And what happens is that if you think about it, that appendix is extremely inflamed, so it's pressing against the nerves of these muscles and that's why it's causing that pain. The other sign is going to be your obturator sign, okay? That's where you basically grab your knee, put it in like this, and this patient's going to be presenting with pain. So you grab the knee, flex it, turn it, and the patient is going to be having pain. That's going to be a positive obturator sign. Also, the right lower quadrant area is known as the McBurney sign, so just make sure that you are familiar with that. McBurney's point, not Murphy's. I always get it confused with cholecystitis, so we'll talk about that later, but it's going to be McBurney's is going to be right lower quadrant, okay? Murphy's is right upper quadrant. So once again, right lower quadrant, it's going to be McBurney's, right upper quadrant, it's going to be Murphy's, right? And then this patient's also going to present with fever, they're going to have guarding also. Diagnosis is usually a clinical diagnosis. We do the physical exam, we see all these signs are positive, and we're like, okay, we want to think about appendicitis, but we can do some labs on them. Uh, they're going to have leukocytosis. Uh, CT is usually um, another thing we can do, but usually the best test is going to be an ultrasound because once again, we want to limit radiation, right? Especially if it's in a child. Sometimes if the patient is very, very obese, sometimes you can't see the appendix with an ultrasound. In these patients, you do have to get a CT scan. Uh, like when I was in the ER, we had a child. He was very, very obese. We did an ultrasound, we couldn't find it, so we ended up doing a CT scan. Treatment is basically an appendectomy. We want to make sure that we're also giving these patients a pain medication because they're in a lot of pain, and then IV antibiotics if we think it perforated. So next one is going to be acute mesenteric ischemia. This is very, very commonly tested also. So this is basically a small intestine or injury that's due to compromised blood supply. Um, it's usually because it involves a superior mesenteric vessel. So basically this is an infarct of the vessels in the blood, okay? And it can kill off bowel. So once again, remember how we have the heart and we have the heart attack, which is basically an infarct. The same thing can happen in the intestines. So the patient's gonna be presenting with abdominal pain that's disproportionate to the physical exam. That's usually pathognomonic for this. They have abdominal pain that's disproportionate to the physical exam. They're going to have also vomiting. They're going to be in a lot of pain, GI bleed, peritonitis. They can also be presenting septic, shock, hypertension, hypotension, sorry, hypotension, which means because that's why they're going into shock, hypotension, tachypnea, where they're breathing a lot, lactic acidosis, which makes sense because some, uh, some of the bowel is becoming necrotic, fever, altermental status. And this is usually going to be common in patients that have that are older. Like if they're older, if they have a history of AFib, if they have a history of having heart attacks, coronary artery disease, or they're hypercoagulable, this makes them usually more prone to getting these acute mesenteric ischemia. So in the questions, to make sure that you're looking for this. And it's usually going to present in an older person, older than 60 they have a history of AFib, of coronary artery disease, or some type of hypercoagulable problem like protein C or S deficiency. They're going to, so what's going to be our diagnosis? We're basically going to do a CTA, so CT angiography, okay? 
but the gold standard is going to be a mesenteric angiography because we want to see which basically um, which blood supply is being compromised. Okay. Treatment is usually supportive. We want to do uh, IV fluids. We want to make sure that we are doing also um, giving them nothing by mouth and then also surgical resection for these patients if some of the bowel is necrotic already. All right, guys. So next one, we're going to go into colorectal disorders. Okay, so colorectal disorders. So we start with diverticulosis. Diverticulosis is very, very common in older people. If not, the majority of elderly people have diverticulosis. During my didactic year, I was very lucky because my program has a cadaver lab. Now, not all programs have cadaver labs, so I really recommend that when you're applying to PA schools or PA programs to see if they have cadaver, pro cadaver labs because you really learn a lot in regards to your anatomy, hands-on. You get to practice your surgical skills, etc. So, during my didactic year, one of our patients or cadavers, we call them patients, uh, cadavers, they had uh, diverticulosis, and you could see it in the intestine. And it was very, very interesting. Literally, it looks like how I would describe it. It's just like bubbles on the intestine. Like you would have little bubbles on the intestine, and you can put your finger through it and. It's basically just a weak wall, and that what ha that's what happens. There's so much pressure in the intestine that it causes, as you get older, your tissues aren't as strong as they used to be. So with this increased pressure, it's basically pushing against the intestinal wall, and that's why they get these like little like outpouchings, how you would call them. So diverticulosis, it's found in the colon. It's sac-like protrusions of the colon wall. It's due to, like I said, increased intra-abdominal pressure, okay? So diverticulosis is just the presence of these outpouchings in the colon, okay? Versus diverticulitis is an inflammation, okay, or infection of these outpouchings in the colon, okay? So that's how you differentiate diverticulosis. The patient can have it, and they can be asymptomatic. Like I said, it's more commonly going to be found in older patients, Usually, it's going to be more commonly found in males than females. It's most commonly found in the sigmoid colon because they believe that's where they has more the part of the colon that has the most pressure. Okay, so it's most commonly found in the sigmoid colon. Also, commonly found in patients that are obese if they're inactive. Also, if they have a low fiber diet, which makes sense, right? If these patients are eating fiber or they're not hydrating themselves, they're going to have they're going to be straining more or their stools aren't going to be as soft as they usually are. So it's going to cause more pressure in the colon, which is going to cause these outpouchings out on the intestinal wall. Okay. So another thing, chronic constipation makes sense, right? You're straining to go to the restroom. That's another etiology for diverticulosis. How are these patients going to present? Usually they're going to be asymptomatic. Like I said, if they do have symptoms, they can present with left lower quadrant pain. So remember how I said you have to make sure that you know your quadrants and your stomach. So you have your four quadrants. So we said right lower quadrant is usually associated with appendicitis. Left lower quadrant commonly associated with diverticulosis. In regards to exam, of course, you know, it's associated with a lot more things. If it's a woman, you want to think about their ovaries, cysts, etc. But in regards to GI, left lower quadrant pain we're thinking about diverticulosis if it's an older male and they also are going to present with painless rectal bleeding okay painless rectal bleeding they're going to have cramping bloating okay they also may have like irregular bowel movements and they may alternate between constipation and diarrhea Diagnosis, uh, usually we find it by accident if we do like a colonoscopy or a CT scan. Like I said, most of these patients are asymptomatic. We also can do a barium enema, but usually the gold standard is going to be a colonoscopy, okay? We want to make sure we're also doing a, a CBC for these patients to make sure that they don't have anemia. So once again, the gold standard is going to be a colonoscopy. Treatment, we want to make sure that these patients are eating a lot of fiber. They're increasing the fiber in their diet. They're drinking more water. Okay. We can give them a uh, pycelium also. 
and we can also do surgery if necessary, like if they've ruptured this um, diverticula, okay? But that's usually like, I said most of these patients are asymptomatic. So now we have diverticulitis. So this is going to be the inflammation of the diverticulum, okay? So these outpouchings, it's basically an inflammation of this. And it's usually due because stool gets stuck there. And remember what we discussed, anything that is just there that causes stasis increases. It's a great environment for bacteria to live in. So with these patients, it causes an obstruction of the lumen and it can cause a bacterial infection, okay? So <clears throat> how is this patient going to present? Once again, they're going to have that left lower quadrant pain, okay? They're going to be presenting with fever, Fever, which makes sense because it's an inflammation, an infection. Left lower quadrant pain, they're going to have leukocytosis on their CBC, which makes sense once again. Whenever we have increased white blood cells, neutrophils, they're going to the site to make sure they're fighting that bacteria. So that's we're going to have increased leukocytosis. And they're going to be presenting with constipation also. They'll have nausea and vomiting, guarding and rigidity, and they're going to have constipation. Constipation is going to be more common than diarrhea in these patients. How are we going to diagnose them? We're going to start with a CT scan with oral, oral and IV contrast. And then we can also, um, yes, so it's going to be a CT scan, guys. What's contraindicated is going to be a colonoscopy or bearing enema. So we don't want to put anything up there, right? Because we want to make sure we're not perforating it because it's already inflamed, it's infected. If we perforated, the patient can go into septic shock, peritonitis. So that's why we want to make sure that we do not do colonoscopies if we suspect diverticulitis. So once again, diverticulosis is an outpouching of the large intestine. It's just there. The patient can present with left lower quadrant pain, usually asymptomatic. It's going to be an older patient. They're going to be presenting with blood in their stool. Diverticulitis is going to be an inflammation. Okay, it's going to be an inflammation of the diverticula, usually due to obstruction. Obstruction of what? Stool, poop's going to get stuck there. Stasis causes an infection. Okay, this is usually an emergency, especially if the patient has perforated it because the patient can become septic, right? Or they can get peritonitis. So what's going to be the treatment for diverticulitis? We're going to basically give them IV antibiotics. We're going to give them broad antibiotics, okay? Because we want to make sure that we're covering like the most common bacteria. So we're going to give them something like uh, Zosin, Meropenem, Ampicillin, and Sulcobactam. Okay, we're going to make sure the patient doesn't take anything by mouth. We want to give these patients IV fluids because they're going to be what? They're going to be vomiting. And we want to make sure that we also do a colectomy, a colectomy if this keeps occurring. So if this patient has already had their second bout of diverticulitis or their third, we want to maybe consider a colectomy for these patients. So next one's going to be irritable bowel syndrome. So irritable bowel syndrome is basically that disease that we don't know the cause of. And it seems like a lot of patients suffer from it. And it's very hard to treat. It's associated with depression. So irritable bowel syndrome with these patients are going to be presenting with chronic abdominal pain and altered bowel habits. And basically, we cannot find the cause of it. There's no organic cause of it. Okay. There's different types. We have irritable bowel uh, syndrome that's associated with constipation. We have irritable bowel syndrome that's associated with diarrhea. And then we have the one that's mixed that has both constipation and diarrhea. Okay. So some of the, um, what it's basically associated with, like I said, it's usually associated with depression. Most of these patients also have fibromyalgia, which, because of course, depression these patients have these, they're, they're suffering. They have these bouts of pain. They're just uncomfortable with their GI tract. And we just, we can't find the cause of it. And we usually just treat them symptomatically. There's no, we can't find the organic cause of irritable bowel syndrome. Sometimes they say it's a diagnosis of exclusion. So with these patients, they're going to basically be presenting with periodic abdominal pain. They're going to have cramping, bloating, flatulence, belching, mucus discharge, tenesmus, which is where they feel like they have to go to the restroom, but they're not going. So it's like that rectal dry heaving. Abdominal pain that's relieved with bowel movement. That's usually pathognomonic is that they go to the restroom in the morning, they're having abdominal pain, and it gets better once they go to the restroom. Uh, with these patients, we're going to diagnose them using the 
Rome criteria, which is basically these patients have to have abdominal pain for more than three months with two or more of the following. Improvement on defecation, like I said, change in frequency where they're going um, very often or not that often. Also, uh, change in form or appearance in their stool. So sometimes they can go from constipation to diarrhea, constipation to diarrhea with these patients. So what are some of the red flags we want to see and we want to investigate more in a patient that's presenting with these symptoms? So if the patient's older than 50, if they're presenting with rectal bleeding, we want to investigate more. If they have melina, okay, if they have diarrhea at night, if they have abdominal pain that's getting worse, if, they, if they're losing weight, if they have a family history also, we want to make sure that we investigate this more, make sure it's not anything associated with something more severe like a cancer. So how are we going to diagnose these, uh, diagnose these patients? Are we going to treat them? How are we going to treat them? So initial is we want to make sure that we educate them, okay? We tell them to better their diet, okay? To make sure that they are increasing the fiber in their food, increasing their fluids, they're drinking a lot of water, and they're exercising. If they have IBS, uh, irritable syndrome, the constipation type, then with these patients, we want to give them osmotic laxatives like polyethylene glycol. We can also give them a lubiprostone or lina, linaclotide. If they have diarrhea, the diarrhea type, we want to give them antidiarrheal agents like loperamide or omodium. We can also give them bile acid sequestrants. If they have abdominal pain, which most of them are complaining of bloating, we can give them antispasmodics as needed like dicyclamine or hyoso hyosamine, okay, antidepressants also we can give. So like you see, most of these are usually just symptomatic treatment for these patients. Okay, guys, so let's go with irritable bowel disease. So don't confuse irritable bowel syndrome and irritable bowel disease. They sound very similar, right? Syndrome usually has no, irritable bowel syndrome, it has no organic cause. Like I said, it's usually a diagnosis of exclusion. These patients will alternate between constipation and diarrhea, they feel better whenever they go to the restroom with these patients, okay? And usually we're just treating the symptoms. So there's different types. They have the diarrhea prominent, the predominant and then the constipation predominant type. But irritable bowel disease is usually a cause. There's like a mechanical cause. So there's two types. We have Crohn's disease and ulcerative colitis. This is very, very highly tested. So make sure that you know the difference between both of them and how they present and where like physiologically and anatomy anatomy wise it presents and how to treatment, which one is treated with surgery, which one is not treated with surgery, et cetera. So let's start into it. So Crohn's disease. Crohn's disease is basically an inflammation or tissue this tissue destruction that occurs anywhere in the GI tract from the mouth to the anus. It can occur anywhere, okay? Versus ulcerative colitis, it's usually just in the rectum to the colon, okay? That's how you differentiate it. Mouth to anus for Crohn's, ulcerative colitis just involves usually the anus and then the colon. So Crohn's disease, it's destruction through the entire depth of the intestinal wall. So this is going to be transmural for Crohn's disease. Inflammation. All the intestinal wall, transmural, Crohn's, okay? Ulcerative colitis, that's not going to be transmural. It's only going to involve the submucosa and the mucosa. Once again, this is how you differentiate between these, okay? Crohn's disease, it's most commonly involves the terminal ileum. But like I said, it can involve anywhere from the mouth to the anus, but it's most commonly found in the terminal ileum, most commonly found in young women, especially if they are Caucasian. The patient's going to be presenting with right lower quadrant pain. They're going to have nausea and vomiting, also diarrhea, but it's just going to be diarrhea. No blood, no pus, nothing, just diarrhea for Crohn's disease. They're also going to be presenting with nausea and vomiting. They're going to have basically flares and then they get better. Flares and they get better with these patients. They're also going to be presenting with uh, malabsorption, weight loss, anemia, vitamin B12 deficiency, they can also have extra intestinal symptoms for these irritable bowel disease for both of them. So they can present with jaundice, uveitis, pyoderma gangrenosum, erythema nodosum, ankylosing spondylitis, renal stones, and liver disease. 
So how are you going to diagnose these patients with Crohn's disease? Basically, like we said, since it presents from the mouth to the anus, we can do an endoscopy. We're going to do an endoscopy with biopsy. What we're going to see is that we're going to see the cobblestone appearance. This is pathognomonic for Crohn's disease, cobblestone appearance. You're also going to see skipped lesions. It's not uniform. It's skipped versus ulcerative colitis. It's not skipped. It's uniform. Once again, for Crohn's disease, it's going to be skipped lesions, cobblestone appearance on your endoscopy. Also, these patients are going to be positive ASCA, positive ASCA, and they're going to have an increased ESR and CRP, and you'll see fat creeping also. So treatment for this one, first line, we want to do something like mesalamine or sulfazalazine. We can also give them metronidazole. If they have flare-ups, because remember these patients go from remissions and they get a flare-up, we can give them a corticosteroid because this is, um, <clears throat> and this will decrease that inflammation for these patients. So surgery, is surgery curative for ulcerative colitis? I'm, I'm sorry, Crohn's disease? No, it's not. Surgery is not curative for Crohn's disease because it happens everywhere. If you go in there and you remove like the esophagus, I mean, there's no point because then it's going to occur in the ileum. Like we said, this happens everywhere. It happens from the mouth to the anus everywhere. So that's why surgery is not curative. So that's Crohn's disease. Ulcerative colitis is basically also a chronic inflammation and ulcers of the colon and rectal mucosa. Remember I said it involves a rectum and the colon, okay? And it involves only the mucosa and the submucosa. And it's Continuous inflammation, so it's no skip lesions. It's going to be continuous. So this patient is also going to be presenting with your exacerbations and remissions. And actually, for this one, smoking is a protective factor. There's a real uh, so those of you who are fans of Dr. House, like I think it was in the second season. I remember the first season. There's an episode where this a patient that presents with ulcerative colitis and the doctor, Dr. House, writes some cigarettes as a prescription. And that's what it was. Cigarettes is shown to be a protective factor in these patients that have ulcerative colitis, and this is the only one. So make sure that you know that they you might get tricked because it's so unique to this GI disorder that it's highly tested. So once again, smoking is a protective factor for these patients with ulcerative colitis. So ulcerative colitis is more commonly found in young adults, usually in the early 20s. And this patient is going to be presenting with abdominal pain, left lower quadrant pain. They're going to have hematochoesia. So they're going to have basically gross blood. So Crohn's disease was, was just diarrhea, right? Just regular diarrhea. Ulcerative colitis is going to be gross blood. This is another way that you can differentiate what type of irritable bowel disease it is. Another thing that we discussed earlier, we said that diverticulosis also presents with blood, right? But usually diverticulosis is found in older patients. So that's another way that you can differentiate is by reading the history and seeing how old the patient is. So if it's an older patient and they're having hematochoesia, blood in their stool, you want to think about diverticulosis. We said that with ulcerative colitis, it's usually a young patient in their 20s and they're presenting with hematochoesia, we want to think about ulcerative colitis with these patients. They're also going to be presenting with tenesmus, right? So we said that rectal heaving, weight loss, anorexia. These patients are also going to be presenting with those extra intestinal symptoms that we discussed. So just for repetition, it's going to be jaundice, uveitis, pyoderma gangrenosum, erythema nodosum, ankylosis spondylitis, renal disease, renal stones, and liver disease, okay? Diagnosis is going to be definitive. It's going to be a sigmoidoscopy or colonoscopy. That makes sense, right? We wouldn't do an endoscopy because it's not found in the upper GI. It's found only in the rectum and the colon. So that's why we're going to do a colonoscopy for these patients or a sigmoidoscopy. And uh, with these patients, another thing that we want to do is that we want to do some labs because some of these patients are anemic. And these patients are going to have positive ANCA, so positive ANCA. What was it for Crohn's? Positive ASCA. Positive ANCA is going to be for ulcerative colitis. What's going to be the treatment? So we're going to go in there and get rid of the part that is affected. So we're going to do a total colectomy. This is going to be a cur curative. So if it asks you what's a curative treatment for ulcerative colitis, 
total colectomy. And we can do this because it only involves the colon and the rectum, right? If they're having acute flare-up, we can do something like systemic steroids and then also mesalamine enema. And for maintenance, we're usually going to give them mesalamine or sofa, sofa, uh, sofa lazine. Sorry, guys. And what are some of the complications of ulcerative colitis? Would these patients are prone to getting toxic megacolon and they're at increased colon cancer risk. So just make sure that you know that with ulcerative colitis. So once again, make sure that you know the difference between Crohn's and ulcerative colitis. Ulcerative colitis presents with hematoclesia, right? That bloody stool. Also with ulcerative colitis, the patient will get better if they are smoking. Smoking is protective. Ulcerative colitis is found in commonly younger men, uh, younger patients, right? Like in their 20s. That's how you can also differentiate hematochoesia from ulcerative colitis to diverticulosis because diverticulosis is usually going to be an older patient, right? Also with ulcerative colitis, it involves a rectum and the colon, okay? And it's going to be no skip lesions, right? It's continuous. Now, Crohn's disease, it's going to be from the mouth to the anus. It's going to be anywhere. It's skipped lesions, okay? And it involves transmural. So it involves the entire inflammation of the intestinal wall. It's transmural. This patient is going to have diarrhea. They're not going to present with hematoclesia. And the treatment for ulcerative colitis is going to be with what? Like a curative, a total colectomy. Diagnosis, colonoscopy, right? Versus Crohn's, it's going to be an endoscopy. All right, guys, so next one we're going to go into, since we discussed the complications of ulcerative colitis, right? We said that some of the common ones is going to be toxic megacolon. Let's discuss toxic megacolon. So toxic megacolon is basically a dilation or widening of the colon that's associated with systemic toxicity. There's swelling, inflammation to the deep colon. It's very severe, and it's life-threatening. Some of the causes, like we discussed, is ulcerative colitis. You can also have Crohn's disease that can cause it, pseudomembranous uh, colitis, like or Clostridium difficile, right, can also cause your toxic megacolon, Hirschsprung's disease, which makes sense because with Hirschsprung's disease, they're lacking a certain type of nerve, so they're not able to pass, and the food just gets stuck there. It can cause inflammation and infection. It can cause this toxic megacolon. If the patient's diabetic, which makes sense because some of these patients are so diabetic that they injure their nerves, not only in their peripheries, but everywhere else in their body. How is this patient going to present? They're going to be presenting with abdominal pain, bloating, distension, fever, tachycardia, leukocytosis. So they're going to have increased neutrophils. They're going to have abnormal bowel sounds bloody diarrhea, vomiting, they're going to have signs of shock, so that ultramental status, that hypotension. How are we going to diagnose it? We're going to do an abdominal x-ray. Now pay attention for this because this is very, very highly tested. On your x-ray, you're going to see loss of hostra marking. So we have the intestine, right, the large intestine, and that has this hostra on the intestine. It's, if I can describe it, look at my fingers. My fingers would be the hostra on the intestine. Well, with toxic megacolon, it's so enlarged that you don't see this hostra on the x-ray. Okay, so that's basically going to be, it. it's going to be losing. You're not going to see loss of hostra. I mean, I've had so many multiple questions on this. This is very highly tested. But pull up an x-ray and it's like literally like a balloon. So you know those like balloons that you inflate with helium and then like they rise and they fall? That's how it looks like. It's just like a balloon and that's how it looks on the x-ray. And it doesn't have that hostra. So abdominal x-ray. And treatment for this, we're going to admit this patient, okay? We're going to admit them to the ICU. We want to make sure we put an NG tube up there and make sure that we're decreasing all that um, inflammation. We want to give them IV fluids. We don't want to give them anything by mouth. We want to make sure that we're correcting their electrolytes also, okay? If the patient's not getting better, then we're going to have to go in there and um, do a colectomy. So... That is a toxic megacolon. Just make sure that you know that it's basically a swelling and inflammation of the deep colon. It's severe and life-threatening because these patients can go into septic shock. Okay, it can perforate also. And with these patients, you're going to do an x-ray. You're going to see loss of hostra. It's going to be this huge and large. Like I said, it literally looks like if you were to blow up a balloon with like helium, like those long balloons, that's how it looks like on the x-ray. So next one's going to be ischemic 
colitis. So ischemic colitis is due to inadequate blood flow through the mesenteric vessels to the large intestine, okay? Usually it involves the watershed areas. Usually the patient with this one is going to have a history once they have a coronary artery disease. They're going to have basically hypercoagulable states. They're going to be older. It's going to be a patient with a history of having a myocardial infarction. And this patient is going to be presenting with like sudden onset of acute abdominal pain. It's not as severe as mesenteric ischemia, but still this patient is going to be presenting with diarrhea, vomiting, hematochoresia, um, weight loss also. We're going to diagnose them with the best initial test, which is going to be a CT scan. We're going to see bowel wall edema and thickening. And then we're going to confirm it with an endoscopy or, or a colonoscopy, okay? We're going to see increased lactate, which makes sense, right? If some of the bowel is dying. And treatment's basically supportive care since most of these tend to go away by itself. We want to make sure that we give them nothing by mouth. We do an NG tube also. And then antibiotics if they have a moderate cause of or moderate ischemic colitis. If it's severe, then we're going to go in there and do surgery. All right, so guys, so now we're going to go into large bowel obstruction. So we discussed small bowel obstruction. Now let's go into large bowel obstruction. Once again, the most common cause is going to be what? Adhesions, surgical adhesions. What about if it's an older patient and they're presenting with a large bowel obstruction? Then we're thinking about colon cancer. Colon cancer is the common cause of basically large bowel obstructions in older patients. And then, of course, hernias, right? How's the patient going to present? They're going to be presenting with abdominal pain, distension, colicky pain, constipation, nausea, and vomiting. They'll have high-pitched bowel sounds also. We're going to diagnose them with an abdominal x-ray. We're going to see a distended colon also with these patients. And with these patients, we want to make sure that we admit them. We're going to give them IV fluids and then surgery also usually. Okay, next one's going to be fecal impaction. So fecal impaction. Thankfully, I haven't had to remove one of these yet, but I'm not done with my rotation. So if I do, I would definitely vlog a video about this. So fecal impaction, basically how it sounds, you have a piece of stool poop that just is not able to pass by. Okay, it's commonly found in elderly patients or patients that have uh, neurological problems. So it, it's basically uh, where the patient has the inability to sense a response to the stool in the rectum. Patients are going to be presenting with constipation, incontinence if they're older, and you'll see fecal seepage or leakage of stool. That's basically how it's going to present on your question. It'll say fecal seepage or leakage of stool. Uh, treatment's going to be, uh, diagnosis is usually going to be a DRE, so you're going to go in there and Put your finger up there um, and you're going to feel a very, very hard stool. You can also do a, an abdominal x-ray if needed and then you'll see that there's decreased free air. And treatment is basically our initial one. We want to go in there and disimpact it digitally, right? We want to remove it. Uh, and we can also do this with warm water enema, mineral oil. We can also get, do uh, polyethylene glycol. And like I said, so treatment is just going up there and removing it. It's usually going to be commonly found in older patients. It's going to be described as fecal seepage or leakage of stool. So next one's going to be, and then usually on this one with x-rays, you see like the stool. So you'll see the GI, see the anus, and you'll see that stool usually on x-ray. Sometimes it's just thrown in x-ray. I've seen some questions like that. Okay, so next topic is going to be hemorrhoids. So hemorrhoids, it's basically varicose veins of the anus and rectum, and we have two types. We have internal and external. Make sure that you know the difference between them. Make sure that you know which one's painful and which one's not painful. Make sure that you know the anatomy, okay? So what are some of the causes of hemorrhoids? Constipation, the patient is straining. If the patient's pregnant, they're obese, they have decreased fiber in their diet, they're not drinking water, okay? They're sitting for a long time, standing for a long time, they're not exercising, they're older, okay? So external is basically dilated veins that are arising from in interior hemorrhoidal plexus. So the anatomy line here is going to be the dentate line. So with external, they're going to be distal to the dentate line. Internal, they're going to be above the dentate line. So you have that dentate line. Distal is going to be external. Above it, it's going to be internal. So internal 
hemorrhoids are basically going to be dilated submucosa veins of the superior rectal plexus. And this is going to be where? If it is internal, it's going to be above the dentate line, right? How's the patient going to present? They're going to be presenting with bleeding, rectal prolapse. Sometimes it'll say that the patient wiped themselves and they saw bright red blood on the toilet paper. And what if it's external? Which one's painful? Which one's painless? External is going to be painful, okay? External, painful, distal to the dentate line, right? External, painful, swelling, worse with defecation. It's so bad that these patients don't want to go to the restroom. Internal is going to be asymptomatic, but they're going to have painless bleeding, okay? So how are we going to diagnose them? We're going to go and look at it, visual inspection. We can also do a DRE if needed, and we're going to palpate the mass if it's enlarged. We can also do an anoscopy if, we want, if it's internal. Treatment is usually going to be, once again, remember we discussed, is that usually the first-line treatment is going to be conservative measurements or lifestyle changes. In these patients, it's going to be conservative management. You want to make sure that you educate the patient on increasing fiber in their diet, avoid straining, um, increase fluids in their diet. You can also do sits baths. It's usually the answer choice is going to be sits baths for these patients. Tell them to exercise, okay? You can give them stool softeners like pycelium, especially if the patient's like pregnant, for example. You can also do topical analgesic and steroids like hydrocortisone, but usually the answer is going to be a sits back, okay? So make sure that you know that. You can also do um, procedures, like if it's internal, you can do rubber band ligation, and, and, and if it's like thrombose and it's clotted, then you can do elliptical excision, okay? And then third line is going to be hemorrhoidectomy. So just make sure that you're reading the question. As it says the patient did the sits bath and it's like the fourth visit, then you want to do maybe like a rubber band ligation, right? And if it's thrombosed, then you want to do make sure that you do that elliptical excision. And usually if it's thrombosed, it'll describe to you that it's like inflamed and just like really big and the patient can't sit down. Okay, guys, so next one's going to be your anal fissures. So anal fissures. So remember how we talked about our Mallory Weiss tears, right? We had like a tear in the esophagus. So this is the same thing with are anal fissures, or anal fissures is just basically a tear of the anal canal below the dentate line, okay? It's benign. It's the most common cause of a patient complaining of having pain in their anus and also anal bleeding. It's uh, most commonly found in the posterior midline of the anal canal. So once again, it's most commonly found, you have to know this, okay, posterior midline of the anal canal. It's going to be posterior. If it's lateral or anywhere else, then it's usually associated with more severe things. But usually the most common ones that are benign are going to be posture midline to the anal canal. Sometimes it's caused due to local trauma. Like if the, for example, if it's a pregnant woman and they had a baby, if they are passing like very large stools, if the patient's constipated, if they're having um, anal sex, uh, some of the secondary causes are tuberculosis, Crohn's disease, sarcoidosis, leukemia, HIV, syphilis, chlamydia. And with these, like I said, if it's secondary and you're thinking about like leukemia, HIV, and syphilis, it's usually going to be lateral, right? Because we said posture is usually benign. So how's this patient going to present? They're going to have rectal pain at rest, okay? They're going to have severe pain that is exacerbated with defecation. Um, they're going to be presenting with anal bleeding. They're going to avoid going to the restroom because it's very, very painful. And basically, you're going to see on your exam longitudinal tear. It's going to be a fresh superficial laceration that usually tells you it's acute. If it's chronic, it's going to have raised edges, white fibers, and sometimes even skin tags also if it's a chronic anal you know, fissure. How are we going to diagnose this? Clinical like I said, you can do a DRE. Um, I'm sorry, it's going to be a clinical diagnosis. You don't do a DRE and anoscopy, which makes sense. It's going to be very painful, right? You don't want to hurt your patient. So you don't do a DRE or anoscopy, okay? And like I said, if it's atypical, like it's like lateral or it's not where it's posterior commonly found, then we want to make sure that we further investigate for the underlying disorder for these patients. How are we going to treat them? So once again, we're going to tell them to 
do conservative measures, right? So we want to make sure that we're telling them to make sure that they are drinking a lot of fluids, they're eating a lot of fibers, we can give them stool softeners, you tell them to do sits bath for these patients, you're going to give them topical lidocaine also. Most of these tend to go away though, so they don't really need treatment. Um, second line, you can also do topical nitroglycerin or calcium channel blockers if needed. Uh, also surgery, if it's like it's not going away or they keep having um, multiple ones in that same area. Okay. So next one we're going to go into is going to be a topic is going to be an anal rectal abscess. So what's an abscess? It's basically an obstruction and infection of the anal gland. So what about an anal rectal fistula? It's basically a connection between two epithelial surfaces. Okay. So what are some of the causes of an anal rectal Abscess, so it's bacterial infection of a blocked anal gland. The most common bacterial are going to be E. coli, okay, definitely. Other causes are like proteus species, streptococcus, staph aureus, bacteroides, um, anaerobes. Um, and E. coli is very commonly found in the GI, right? So E. coli, very commonly found in the GI. E. coli is also commonly associated with urinary tract infections. Usually with urinary tract infections, what happens, that's why we educate patients to wipe from front to back, right? Not to back from front. Because if they go to the restroom, they wipe from front to back, they go number two. E. coli is the most common type of like GI gut bacteria. We can introduce that bacteria and it can go up and cause a urinary tract infection. So E. coli is usually the most uh, one of the most common causes of your interrectal abscesses and your fistulas and also staph aureus because staph aureus is found on the skin, right? So other causes and etiologies for our interrectal abscesses and fistulas is usually if the patient has Crohn's disease, because remember with Crohn's disease, we're talking that it, it involves the entire intestine, so it, it's transmural, which makes sense. This is why it can cause a uh, fistula, right? Also, patients that are diabetics, it's very common, and it's also very commonly found in males more than females. So how is this patient going to present if they have an anal rectal abscess? They're going to be presenting with rectal pain that's worse whenever they sit, whenever they go to the restroom. It's throbbing, it's swollen, it's red, it's inflamed. And then a fistula, they're going to be presenting with drainage, purulent drainage, bleeding. It's going to be itching, also tender to whenever you touch it to the patient. So how are we going to diagnose this? Basically, we're going to do a physical exam, okay? And we're going to look at it. We can also do a DRE. And treatment for this, if it's an abscess, we want to make sure that we do an IND, right? We want to go in there and open it up and take all that junk out. We can give them antibiotics if we think that the patient, for example, is immunosuppressed or if they have symptoms of an infection with these patients. What about a fistula? So with the fistula, we want to make sure that we do surgical incision and excision under anesthesia, okay? So surgery is usually needed for a fistula for um, these patients. So think about it. So these abscesses, they want to come out, okay? And that's why we want to make sure that we IND them. If they don't come out, they're going to find a way to come out, and this is where you have your fistula, Okay. So like I said, a fistula is a connection between two epithelial surfaces, and that's where you have a fistula. So going on to that, we also have pilonidal disease. So pilonidal disease, I saw this a lot during my surgery rotation. It's very, very um, painful. So with these patients, you're going to be presenting with basically acute abscess or draining sinus in the sacral coccygeal area. So it's going to be in the back right here, sacral coccygeal area, secondary to obstruction of a hair follicle, okay? Usually these patients don't even know they have it until it starts becoming infected. So treatment for this is usually incision and drainage. They're going to have pilonidal cystostomy or excision of the sinus tract and cyst marsupilation. So it's usually going to be surgery. Um, a lot of patients we saw had surgery for these uh, pilonidal <clears throat> disease. So once again, it's basically they have an abscess or draining sinus in the sacrococcygeal area. And it's because there's obstruction of the hair follicle. And these can sometimes be recurring also in these patients. Treatment, like I said, it's usually going to be surgery. You're going to do a cyst marsupilation or a pilonidal cystostomy or excision of the sinus tract 
for these patients. Okay, guys, so next one we're going to go into colonic polyps, okay? Colonic polyps. They're more commonly found in the rectosigmoid area, and most of them tend to be asymptomatic. But if they do have symptoms, the patient's going to be presenting with rectal bleeding. What's going to be the treatment? We want to, want to go in there and get rid of them because it can become malignant and cause cancer, okay? So with this, what we want to know is that certain individuals are more prone to getting these, okay? So for example, we have juvenile polyps, which involves children under 10. They get these polyps, they're vascular and common, and we want to make sure that we're removing them. There's also inflammatory polyps or pseudopolyps. These are associated with ulcerative colitis, and these are usually benign, okay? And then we have our basically adenomatous polyps, which are benign, but they can become malignant and they can cause colon cancer. So they're precursors to adenocarcinoma. So there's different types, there's three types. We have tubular, tubulovillus, and villus. Make sure that you know which one is the bad one, okay? Which one has a higher risk of turning into adenocarcinoma? So we have tubular, this is the most common one, and this one has the smallest risk of malignancy, so that's tubular. And then we have tubular villus, which one makes intermediate risk, right? And then we have villus. This has the greatest risk. How I memorized it is that villus sounds like villain. So that's how I thought this one is like the worst one. Villus, villain. Once again, the tubulus one is going to be the most common one and tubular one. And it's going to have the smallest risk of malignancy. Okay. So now we're going to go into constipation. So constipation is basically where a patient has trouble passing a stool, okay? And they're usually straining. Usually with these patients, they're going to be passing or having less than three stools per week, okay? Less than three stools per week. Can you imagine? Less than three stools per week is defined as constipation, some of the uh, causes is usually like primary, like functional, where the patient is constipating and there's no underlying disorder that is causing the constipation. Secondary is because they have some type of systemic disorder. Uh, if they're taking certain medications, right, like some of your narcotics will make patients constipated, some of your opiates will make these patients constipated, or if they have obstructing colonic lesions or secondary causes also of constipation. But the most common cause is usually because the patient doesn't have a good diet. They're not hydrating themselves. They're not increasing fiber in the diet. This is what I tell my husband all the time. And I'm like, you have to start like eating your grains and like eating food that has like high fiber. Okay. And making sure that you're drinking a lot of water. So <clears throat> like I said, once again, some of the causes, uh, if it's systemic, it can be hypothyroidism, hyperparathyroidism. Remember I are grown stones, psychiatric overtones for hyperparathyroidism, very commonly associated with constipation. Um, also, if the patient's diabetic, if the patient has like neurological disorders like multiple sclerosis because those nerves aren't working, if they are paraplegic, hypokalemia is very commonly associated with constipation, hypercalcemia, right? Because we talked about hyperparathyroidism, hypercalcemia, other stones, grown psychiatric overtones. If they're taking certain medications, like I said, opioids, um, uh, NSAIDs, also anticholinergics, okay? Calcium channel blockers, also very commonly associated with constipation. If they have structural problems like rectal prolapse, uh, strictures, uh, colonic masses, Hirschsprung disease, right? Which is where they're missing those neurons. And then also if they have... Um, Megacolon, okay? So how are we going to diagnose these patients? Like I said, they have to have less than three stools per week to be uh, diagnosed with constipation, okay? Treatment is, once again, we're going to tell them to increase their fiber, increase their fluids. We can give them medications like uh, Pycillium, uh, which is better than our, we prefer those over our osmotic laxatives like polyethylene glycol. We can also give them... Um, Enemas, which is like temporary relief. If there's like an obstruction there, like a cancer or something that's causing the constipation, then of course we're going to cause, cause surgery, okay? So now we're going to go into our hepatic disorder. So hepatic, 
uh, disorders that involve the liver. So let's start with cirrhosis. I know I briefly discussed this when we were talking about esophageal varices, but cirrhosis is basically an inflammation of the liver, okay? It causes hepatocyte destruction, okay? And there's usually fibrosis and the liver just stops working. It's not working normally like it used to. And it's usually irreversible with these patients that are cirrhosis. The most common cause is going to be alcoholism. Alcoholism is the most common cause. Of course, there's other types, other causes, but by far alcoholism is the most common cause of cirrhosis. Other causes are, for example, if the patient has hepatitis B, hepatitis C, that's chronic. If they are have um, fatty liver disease, right? Um, if they're basically taking certain medications, they can also develop cirrhosis like long-term, like acetaminophen or uh, methotrexate also, if they have hemochromatosis or Wilson's disease, congestive heart failure. How's this patient going to present? So the first symptoms that they're going to present when they have like early onset, they're, they may be asymptomatic. Sometimes they'll just say that they're tired, they're weak, okay, they're losing a lot of weight. Usually, if they've been having cirrhosis for a long time, this is where they present with the symptoms that we're very, very familiar with. They're going to be jaundice, right? That scleral icterus. Their skin's going to be yellow. Uh, they're going to have pruritus, which is going to be like itchiness. They're going to have that ascitis, right? That fluid wave with these patients with their ascitis. They're going to have splenomegaly. Um, the esophageal varices that we were talking about. Hemorrhoids also with these patients. <clears throat> And then also encephalopathy, bruising, okay? Gynecomastia, if it's chronic, uh, testicular atrophy, spider angiomas, hemorrhoids, caput medusa. And what are some of the symptoms of acute failure with these patients? They're going to have coagulopathy, right? Because uh, we have vitamin K that is involves is in the liver, okay? And it's not producing that anymore, and the liver is not working, so patients are going to be more prone to having coagulopathy problems. Uh, we're gonna have the patient having hypoglycemia, okay? And we're prone to having infections also. So what's gonna be our initial diagnostic tool for these patients? We wanna do an abdominal ultrasound, but our gold standard is gonna be our liver biopsy. We wanna go in there and biopsy, but our initial one's gonna be an ultrasound, okay? Another thing you need to know is that we do the child Pew score. This is going to tell us how severe the cirrhosis is. So basically, if the patient has increased LFTs for liver function tests, like your AST, your ALT, your bilirubin, uh, your ALP, ammonia, GGP, and they're going to have also increased PT and INR also for these patients. What's going to be the treatment? We want to make sure that we're treating the underlying cause, okay? If it's hemochromatosis, we want to make sure that we're treating the underlying cause. If it's Wilson's disease, treat that. If it's because they're drinking a lot of alcohol, tell them to stop drinking alcohol if we catch it early. If they have hepatitis B or hepatitis C, um, but usually the treatment's going to be liver transplant for these patients, okay? All right, guys. So now I want to discuss basically what are some of the complications of cirrhosis. So some of the complications is portal hypertension, okay? Portal hypertension is where you have decreased blood flow that goes through the liver, and this is going to cause ascites. This is going to have peripheral edema, spleen. Everything's going to back up, okay? So that's why you have that peripheral edema. You have splenomegaly. You're going to have these esophageal varices because everything's backing up. The liver isn't working anymore. And we have, like, blood vessels that go through it. But since it's not working every anymore, everything's going to be backing up. We're going to have, uh, with these patients, um, hemorrhoids also. But usually with portal hypertension, bleeding is the most life-threatening complication. And then diagnosis, uh, usually it's going to be depending on the symptoms, and then we can do a paracentesis for these patients. Treatment is going to be usually with your transjugular intrahepatic portal sy systemic shunt. So it's um, with our tips, this is going to help us uh, decrease all that pressure that's going on and help us not creating that backflow, okay? Uh, we can also do beta blockers. It's going to also help us decrease that portal pressure. Next one's going to be ascites. So ascites is going to be accumulation of fluid that's moved into the peritoneal cavity due to portal hypertension and hypoalbuminemia, okay? Hypoalbuminemia. This patient is 
going to presenting with abdominal pain, um, abdominal distension, shifting dullness, fluid wave also. So you can actually move the positions and you see that fluid wave with these patients. Um, and this is the most common complication of cirrhosis is going to be ascites. We're going to diagnose it. We're going to do abdominal ultrasound. We're going to do a paracentesis, okay? And treatment is basically a diuretic. We're going to give them something like furosemide or spironolactone for these patients. We're also going to remove that fluid with a paracentesis also. And then another complication is going to be hepatoencephalopathy, okay? This is due to decreased liver function where the liver is not. So our liver detoxifies everything that we put into it. If the liver isn't working, then we're going to have all these toxins. So basically, the liver is unable to convert ammonia to urea. So all these toxins are going to go into the brain. Okay, all this ammonia is going to cause this hepatoencephalopathy. Okay. Patient's going to be presenting with um, decreased mental function, ultra mental status. They're going to have poor concentration. They'll have the asterixis, which is going to be the, flip, the flapping tremor. Okay. Rigidity, hyperreflexia also. And diagnosis is basically clinical. Uh, we're going to see that the patient has increased blood ammonia. And treatment, first line, is going to be lactulose. Make sure that you know that. Okay. Patient has cirrhosis. So they're presenting with the hand flappings on tremental status. Give him lactulose. He patterns philopathy. Next one is going to be spontaneous bacterial peritonitis or SBP. This is basically where there's an infection of the fluid, the acidic fluid with these patients. Okay. The most common cause is going to be E. coli because we said, remember, E. coli is usually the most common gut bacteria. So the most common cause is going to be E. coli for these patients. They're going to be presenting with abdominal pain, fever, chills, which makes sense, right? Because it's an infection going on. This patient's also going to be presenting with vomiting, rebound tenderness. Uh, they will have ascites. And diagnosis is that we want to do par paracentesis of the fluid, of the uh, acetic fluid, the ascites. And we're going to see that they have increased white blood cells. We want to make sure that we gram stain also. They're going to have white blood cells more than 500, PMNs more than 250. Treatment's going to be with broad-spectrum antibiotics, usually like our third-generation cephalosporins for these patients. And then we want to make sure that we repeat the paracentesis in two to three days. Other complications is that the patient's going to have splenomegaly, like we discussed earlier. Uh, fluid can't get into the liver, so it tends to back up into the spleen. Other causes is varices, like I said, uh, hepatorenal failure also. Something that I saw a lot during my nephrology rotation was hepatorenal uh, failure, which basically causes renal vasoconstriction. There's decreased blood flow to the kidneys, so the kidneys are not working. You can, the patient's also going to be presenting with gynecomastia, spider angiomas, and pal uh, palmar erythema. This is because they have increased estrogen in their blood. They're also going to be presenting with hypoalbuminemia and decreased clotting factors. This is why they have the prolonged PT, right? So like I said, vitamin K is ineffective because the liver is not working. So treatment for this is usually fresh frozen plasma. And then of course, hepatocellular carcinoma is very common in these patients that have cirrhosis. And it's a common complication, something you want to avoid for these patients, okay? So that was cirrhosis. Make sure that you know the complications and how it presents, okay? All right, guys, so now we're going to go into our viral hepatitis. We have different types. We have A, B, C, D, and E, okay? Make sure that you know the differences between them, which ones are transmitted from blood to blood, uh, IV users, which ones are can turn into hepatocellular carcinoma, which ones are RNA viruses, which ones are DNA viruses, okay? So make sure that you know that. We're going to go into each one. So hepatitis A. This is transmitted fecal orally, um, shellfish. It's the most commonly found in U.S. and children. So it's the most common one here in the U.S. and children. Um, usually it'll say in the vignette that there was some type of recent travel. The patient's going to be presenting with nausea and vomiting. They'll have jaundice also, fever, clay-colored stools, which makes sense, right? Because the liver is responsible for com uh, converting bilirubin, which is going to give you that stool, that brown color whenever you go to the restroom. So if you go to the restroom and you're having like these clay stools, you're like, oh my God. 
So clay colored stools, you're gonna be presenting with right upper quadrant paints. Remember that's when I told you, you have to make sure that you know your anatomy, your right upper quadrant, right lower quadrant, left upper quadrant, left lower quadrant. So we have the liver on your right side, sorry, I'm your right side. So it's gonna be right upper quadrant. Pain with these patients, they're gonna have an enlarged liver, splenomegaly also they're gonna have. Diagnosis is basically, we're gonna do um, serology. So we're gonna see a positive anti HAV IgM. It's usually an acute infection that's in its house that the patient does have hepatitis A. And usually treatment for hepatitis A is just basically symptomatic. Most of them get better in one to two months. Um, we want to make sure that we do vaccinate all our children. Usually hepatitis A is given in 12 months. So once again, hepatitis A, shellfish, fecal oral, usually the patient gets better by themselves. I've seen questions on this where you're, it's describing hepatitis and it tells you what's, what are you going to tell this patient? And you just basically tell them that this is a viral infection and it's going to go away. They just have to make sure that they're drinking fluids and taking care of themselves, but it's going to go away. Okay. So next one is going to be hepatitis B. So hepatitis B is transmitted through body fluids, sexually also, IV drug use, and also from mom to baby. Okay. With these patients. This one is the only DNA virus. So both, so the rest of them, A, C, D, and E, are basically RNA viruses. The only one that's DNA is going to be hepatitis B. Make sure that you know that because that's what makes it unique for hepatitis B. Hepatitis B is the only um, DNA virus, okay? So make sure that you know that. How is this patient going to present with hepatitis B? Once again, symptoms of hepatitis. Nausea and vomiting, jaundice, hepatomegaly, splenomegaly, and we're going to do serology on these patients. If the patient has hepatitis B E antigen, basically it means that they have, they're very infectious and they have maybe like chronic hepatitis, okay? Treatment is going to be basically... Um, we want to make sure that we're preventing this by doing a hepatitis B vaccine, which is usually given to infants at birth, at two months, at six months. And then if a patient was exposed to hepatitis B, um, we can immunize them. So next one's going to be hepatitis C. This one is transmitted bloodborne pathogen uh, through sexual intercourse. And once again, also baby to mommy. Okay. This one has a very high rate of turning into chronic infections okay so how's this patient going to present basically they're going to be presenting with nausea and vomiting anorexia jaundice hepatomegaly splenomegaly adenopathy as you can see these present very very similar um if it's chronic they can present with fatigue and diagnosis is going to be once again um hcv rna via pcr is usually going to be our diagnostic test and usually there's no uh, vaccine for hepatitis c we, treatment is usually going to be with a sofo, sofosbuvir, okay? And you can also give them um, NSSA inhibitors like Velpatsevir, Ledipasevir, um, and this is going to be done for eight weeks, okay? And then we have hepatitis D. So hepatitis D requires hepatitis B, okay, to be able to um, basically infect. So for the patient to get the virus, they need hepatitis B. So hepatitis D and B, hepatitis D needs hepatitis B in order to cause infection, okay? Now, if you have hepatitis B co-infected with hepatitis D, it's going to be a more severe infection than just having hepatitis B. So make sure that you know this. How is it transmitted? It's basically transmitted as a bloodborne body fluids. Once again, if hepatitis D and B are together, it causes a super infection. So basically, it exacerbates the presentation of hepatitis B, and it increases the risk by like three times for hepatocellular carcinoma if you have hepatitis B and hepatitis D. We're going to diagnose it once again with serology. And then we have hepatitis E. Uh, with these patients, they're going to have a history of traveling to like India, Asia, Africa, and Central America. It's transmitted fecal orally also. These patients are going to be presenting with nausea and vomiting, anorexia, jaundice, fever, dark urine, clay-colored stools, right upper quadrant pain, 
splenomegaly. Diagnosis is going to be with our serology again. And then treatment. Um, basically, we want to make sure that we are vaccinating these patients if they go to these areas that are endemic. So in general, as you can tell, for all the hepatitis, we said that hepatitis B is the only DNA virus, right? The rest of them are RNA viruses. Hepatitis D needs hepatitis B in order to infect. If hepatitis B is co-infected with hepatitis D, it causes a super infection and it increases the risk for a patient to have hepatocellular carcinoma. So with these patients with hepatitis, we want to do labs on them, right? Their LFT, so their liver function tests are going to be increased. Um, their AST and ALT levels are going to be increased also. Uh, we want to check their bilirubin. We want to make sure that we're checking their PT. Uh, we want to make sure that we're checking their IgG and IgM to see if it's an acute infection or a chronic infection. And treatment, like I said, usually these patients get better and it's spontaneous. They don't need treatment if they have hepatitis A, B, and E, okay? And usually the treatment, like I said, is going to be supportive. You want to make sure that they are uh, eating well, they're hydrating, they're resting. Uh, for hepatitis A and E, remember we said those are fecal oral, they're washing their hands if they're going to these areas that are endemic for these um, uh, for these type of hepatitis also. And then, of course, some of the complications for these hepatitis is that they can present with fulminant hepatitis. So they can have encephalopathy, GI bleeding, coagulopathy, esophageal varices. And then, of course, they can also present, they can cause hepatocellular carcinoma. Okay, guys, so let's go into cholelithiasis. Basically, let's start into our gallbladder or biliary uh, disorders. This is like my favorite subject from GI. I love it. So... You have to make sure that you know the terminology of cholelithiasis, cholecystitis, cholangitis, cholelithiasis. You have to make sure that you know the terminology for these, okay? Cholelithiasis is just gallstones, okay? Gallstones, that's it, okay? Cholecystitis is where you have an inflammation of the gallbladder. Sometimes because those gallstones will like come out and they'll lodge and it causes this inflammation, okay? And then you have cholodocolithiasis, where you have basically a stone that's in the common bile duct, okay? And then you have cholangitis, which is very, very severe. We'll go over it. We have the um, how it presents, and these patients can go into toxic shock. So let's go into each one. So cholelithiasis, like I said, is just gallstones that are present in the gallbladder, okay? How is it going to present? So we're going to have the five Fs, right? Fat, 40, female, fertile, and fair. Fat, 40, female, fertile, and fair, okay? Also, it's commonly found in patients that are on oral contraceptives also. So we have different types of gallstones. So we have cholesterol, we have pigment, and mixed. Cholesterol is by far the most common one. It's usually going to be described as yellow to green, commonly found in patients that are obese, if they are on oral contraceptives, if they have hyperlipidemia, if they're diabetic, also if they are Native American, it's commonly found old age, also cirrhosis. And then we have our pigmented ones, which are black stones. These are commonly found in patients that have some type of blood disorder like a hemo hemolysis, okay? So hemolytic anemia, for example, or alcoholic cirrhosis. And then we have our mixed, which is going to be components of both cholesterol and pigment. Um, usually mixed is the common ones that we found for, find uh, for stones. So how is this patient going to present? Usually it's just they have stones in their gallstone, in their gallbladder. Usually it's an incidental find. Uh, you, you're doing an ultrasound and you find, you find gallstones. So most of these patients are asymptomatic. Um, if they do have symptoms, they'll have biliary colic, which is basically a temporary obstruction of the cystic duct. So what happens is that sometimes those stones will like and the gallbladder will come out and then they'll go back in. And usually when that happens, that's when the patient is presenting with that biliary colic uh, pain. They're also going to be presenting with right upper gastric pain. So right upper gastric, remember we were talking about the quadrants. So right, right upper gastric pain, they're going to present with that. Um, they're going to have pain after eating. And then also the BOA sign, which is going to be pain that refers to the shoulder. Okay. Diagnosis is going to be usually with an abdominal ultrasound, uh, right upper quadrant ultrasound. Treatment, like I said, most of these patients are asymptomatic. If it's asymptomatic, we just want to make sure that we're observing them. They don't need treatment. But if they're having these 
recurrent bouts of pain where that gallstone comes out and it's causing this biliary colic, then we can go in there and do a cholecystectomy, which is just going there and cutting the gall gallbladder out. Uh, during my surgery rotation, my doctor did so many of these and they were super quick, like less than 20 minutes. Go in there, just cut it out, like laparoscopically, just go in there in the stomach and cut it out and then just bring it out in a bag and you could see it. And some of them were like huge if they had so many gallstones. So next one is going to be cholelithiasis. This is going to be gallstones that are present within the common bile ducts. So once again, cholelithiasis, gallstones that are present within the common bile duct. So how is this patient going to present? So they're going to be usually asymptomatic. They might present with right upper quadrant pain, so epigastric pain. Also, they can present with jaundice because it's getting stuck in that common bile duct, right? So just for anatomy-wise, we have the common bile duct, and then we have the common bile duct like this, and then it goes into the cystic duct, which is going to be the gallbladder. So you have the gallbladder, the cystic duct, common bile duct. Okay, if you keep going up, we have a cystic duct here. You keep going up, you're going to have your... Um, your common hepatic duct, okay? So common hepatic duct, you have the liver here, drains, goes together, you have the cystic that they come together and they form the common bile duct. So if there's a stone in that bile duct, common bile duct, then it's gonna cause uh, jaundice, right? Because it's, it, the bilirubin isn't able to get excreted, okay? And that's why this patient's going to be jaundiced. Um, also, they, for, for diagnosis, basically, we're going to look at their total and direct bilirubin, which is usually going to be elevated. We're going to look at their alkaline phosphatase. We're also going to do a right upper quadrant ultrasound also. But the gold standard for cholelithiasis is going to be an ERCP. It's both diagnostic and therapeutic. We're basically going to go in there and remove the stone, okay? Treatment for this is usually we want to give them pain medications. And once again, we want to do the ERCP with sphincterotomy and stone extraction with stent placement. Like I said, we're going to go in there and get rid of that stone that's in that common bile duct. We can do a cholidocal uh, lithotomy, but it's usually not commonly done. Because what are some of the complications of these common bile duct stones? They can cause cholangitis, which I'm going to dis uh, discuss. This one can turn into septic shock. It's an emergency. It can cause obstructive jaundice. It can cause acute pancreatitis. It can cause biliary cirrhosis. So that's why we, we want to make sure we're doing that ERCP, going up there, getting rid of that stone. Now we're going to go into acute cholecystitis. Remember we talked about cholelithiasis, it's gallstones just in the gallbladder. Cholecystitis is one of the stones has actually moved into the cystic duct, okay? Cystic duct, know your anatomy. So gallbladder with a cystic duct. So one of these gallstones has lodged into the cystic duct. It's causing that inflammation. Remember, it said whenever there's stasis causing this inflammation, it's going to cause an infection. So that's what it is. It's basically an infl inflammation of the gallbladder. Damage to the gallbladder walls because, um, no, it's just an inflammation of the gallbladder. So there's a gallstone that's lodged into the cystic duct, okay? So it's an inflammation of the gallbladder. Once again, it's going to be what or F white, fat, female, uh, fertile, uh, 40, and fair. So with these patients, they're going to be presenting with right upper quadrant pain. So that's going to be what? That's going to be right upper quadrant pain, epigastric pain, fever. They're going to have that Murphy sign, right? So we said Murphy sign is up here, right upper quadrant. McBurney's point, it's going to be the right lower quadrant, which is appendicitis. So make sure that you know the difference between them. I always confuse them. Murphy sign, McBurney's. Murphy sign, McBurney's. Murphy sign. So Murphy sign is usually going to be positive with this patient. Basically, they have inspiratory arrest uh, during depalpation. So you tell them, you tell them to go, <gasps> you palpate, and they're going to be like, ah, it's going to hurt a lot. That's going to be your positive uh, Murphy sign for these patients. Okay, they're also going to have hypoactive bowel sounds. They're going to have a positive BOA sign also, which is pain that radiates to that right shoulder. They're going to be anorexic. They're going to be vomiting. These patients are going to look very, very sick when they come in through the door. Diagnosis is going to be, once again, we're going to do an ultrasound. We're going to see a thickened wall distended that have stones, okay? Usually the gold standard is going to be high to scan. So once again, make sure that you're reading the question. If it says, what is the next initial 
treatment for this patient, we're going to do what? We're going to do an ultrasound. If it tells what is the gold standard, we're going to do a HIDA scan. Treatment for these patients, we want to admit him, right? We want to give him fluids because most of these patients are vomiting. Make sure that we're correcting their electrolyte imbalances like we've discussed over and over again. And we also want to make sure we're giving them pain medication. But the definitive treatment is going in there, cutting the uh, bio, the, the gallbladder and getting rid of it. So the cholecystectomy is going to be the treatment, okay? Next one, we're going to go into chronic cholecystitis, which is basically an inflammation of the gallbladder. You're going to have damage to the gallbladder walls due to repeated attacks. Um, what is the cause of this? It's basically a patient that has recurrent acute cholecystitis, okay? They're having this these attacks over and over again that's causing this damage to the gallbladder wall, okay? They're going to have these walls that are thick and scarred, and they're small. So the signs and symptoms similar to acute cholecystitis, um, with these patients, once again, we want to make sure that we do emergent cholecystectomy. We go in there and we get rid of the um, gallbladder. It's usually laparoscopic. Very, very interesting surgery to, to see. Now we're going to go into cholangitis. This is very, very highly tested, so make sure that you know this. This is basically a bacterial infection of the biliary tract. It's usually due because there's an obstruction. Remember, we talked about obstruction stasis infection, okay? You're going to have bacterial overgrowth, and this is life-threatening because it can put the patient in shock, okay? Most common cause is cholecystitis. Most common bacteria involved is going to be, which one did, which one did we say is most commonly involved in the GI, in the gut? It's going to be E. coli, Okay. How, does, how is the patient going to present? Make sure that you know this. It's going to be your Chagos triad, okay? They're going to have hypotension. Um, I'm sorry, Chagos triad. They're going to have fever. They're going to have right upper quadrant pain and jaundice. So once again, Chagos triad. Fever, right upper quadrant pain, and jaundice, which makes sense. Jaundice, remember, if we think about the anatomy, it's going to be in the common bile duct, right? It's going to be obstructing both the cyst, the cystic duct is coming and the hepatic duct, they go, join into the common bile duct. That's why the patient's becoming jaundiced, okay? So once again, so we said the charcoal trial was going to be what? Fever, right upper quadrant pain, and jaundice. This is very commonly found in women. And then we have Raynaud's pentod. Once this patient gets here to this point, it's an emergency. They're becoming septic. They're going to have basically charcoal triad, which was your right upper quadrant pain, uh, their fever, right, the jaundice. Plus, on top of that, they're going to have hypotension, and they are also going to present with it was hypotension, charcoal triad, and then also an altered mental status for these patients. Okay, once again. Charcoal triad plus ultramental status, hypotension, they're going to be septic, okay? What is going to be the diagnosis? Basically, we're going to do an ultrasound to start, but the gold standard is going to be a col uh, cholangiography, okay? Cholangiography. And this is an emergency. We want to make sure that we're giving uh, this patient IV antibiotics, bradsprectum, right, or ampicillin uh, sulbobactam. We're giving them fluids. We're monitoring them. We want to make sure that we decompress the common bile duct when the patient is stable uh, through PTC or ERCP. And then some of the complications of this is if it's not treated is that they can develop a hepatic abscess. This is the most serious one. It has a high a mor morbidity and mortality rate. Okay. So once again, acute cholangitis, it's basically an obstruction in the um, common bile duct. It's causing an infection. The most common bacteria that involves going to be E. coli. It's usually going to present with a woman. It's going to be your charcoal triad, which is going to be your fever, right upper quadrant pain, right? And then we said jaundice. And then we have pentods, which is just, uh, I'm sorry, Raynaud's pentod, which is severe. That's charcoal triad, plus on top of that, hypotension, ultramentosetis. These patients are septic, okay? So now we're going to build primary biliary col cholangitis, also known as PBC. This is an autoimmune T cell mediated attack on the bile ducts, okay? So your own body is attacking these bile ducts and it's causing basically a destruction of the intrahepatic ducts. It's commonly found in women between 40 to 50 years old. It's idiopathic and it's usually associated with autoimmune disorders. So this patient will have a family history, okay? And diagnosis, well, more like how is this patient going to present? They're going to be presenting with 
pruritus, which is usually very, very commonly associated with PSC. So the itchiness, they're going to be presenting with right upper quadrant pain, weight loss, uh, fatigue, okay? They can also present with xanthomas or xanthelasma, hyperpigmentation. And diagnosis is that we're going to do a serum anti-mitochondrial antibody. Positive AMA, this is high yield for PVC. Positive AMA, they're also going to have an increased GT. Your LFTs are going to be increased like alkaline phosphatase, ALT, AST, which makes sense, right? Because that duct is being destroyed, that uh, hepatic ducts are being destroyed. They're also going to have a conjugated uh, bilirubin. Um, that's what we want to look for. And treatment first line is that we're going to give uh, ursodiol, okay? Ursodiol, that's like, that's like high yield for PBC. Once again, ursodiol. For the itchiness, because these patients are going to be very itchy, we can give them something like a cholestyramine, okay? And if it's advanced, they're going to need a liver transplant for these patients. So once again, PBC, primary cholangitis, is in an autoimmune disorder where the T cells basically attack the bile ducts. They cause destruction of the intrahepatic ducts, commonly found in a woman between 40 to 50 years old. The patient's going to be presenting with right upper quadrant pain, pruritus, okay, jaundice, fever, Diagnosis, we're going to do a serum anti-mitochondrial antibody, which is going to be positive. First line treatment, it's going to be ursodiol. If it tells you what can you give this patient for the itchiness, we're going to give them a cholestyramine, uh, okay? All right, next one's going to be primary sclerosing cholangitis. This is basically a progressive chronic inflammation of both the intra and extra hepatic ducts, okay? Usually the patient's going to be a male with the history of ulcerative colitis, they're going to be presenting with pruritus, or they may be asymptomatic. If they do have symptoms, it's going to be pruritus, that itchiness, jaundice, malaise, okay? Um, diagnosis, you're going to have increased alkaline phosphatase. We can do a cholangiography also, right upper quadrant ultrasound. We're going to do a, a liver biopsy also. And these patients are going to have positive P anca. Treatment is basically, we want to uh, do supplementation of fat-soluble vitamins, we're going to give them a tac tacrolimbus also, which is an immunosuppressive, ursodiol also. For the itchiness, what are we going to give? Cholestyramine, uh, same as primary sclerosine, uh, uh, primary biliary cholangitis. So we're going to give um, cholestyramine also. And then, of course, uh, we can do ERCP also to dilate those inflamed ducts. And then surgery is usually going to be your uh, curative uh, treatment, which is going to be a liver transplant. Okay, guys, so we finished basically biliary. So why don't we go into the pancreas now, okay? So pancreas. So we have acute pancreatitis, which is basically a sudden inflammation of the pancreas where there's destruction by its own enzymes. So there's auto-digesting. There's a really, really cool photo if you Google. Um, I'm a huge visual person. So if you're a huge visual person, I really, really recommend that you Google pancreatitis. And then you'll see that um, there's this picture of this pancreas and it's literally eating itself. And that's basically what's happening with pancreatitis is that there's this, it's destroying itself by its own enzymes. It's auto digesting itself. So what are some of the common causes of pancreatitis? You have to know this, this is very, very high yield. So it's gonna be gallstones and alcohol abuse, which makes sense if you think about it anatomy wise, right? If there's a gallstone and it's obstructing um, that uh, pancreatic duct, then it can cause pancreatitis. And then, of course, alcohol. Other causes are like trauma, steroids, mumps, also scorpion stings, which is very, very interesting. So now I'm going to be more afraid of scorpions. Also, sometimes it can be traumatic, like if the patient had like an ERCP, um, and then also certain medications can cause it, like thiazides, sulfa medications. And then, of course, your increased triglycerides and um, hyperlipidemia. That's why it's really important that in patients that have triglycerides more than like 600 or like at 800, they're prone to getting pancreatitis. And that's why we have to make sure that we decrease and we're giving them appropriate medications for their increased uh, triglycerides. But what you need to know, the most common causes are going to be your alcohol, and gallstones, okay? So how is this patient going to present? So remember, we want to make sure that we are familiar with how in the GI, 
um, certain disorders are going to present. So remember we said right upper quadrant, we're thinking about the liver, we're thinking about the gallbladder. We said right lower quadrant, we're thinking about appendicitis. Left lower quadrant, we're thinking about maybe like diverticulitis or like ulcerative colitis. So this is where you want to know your anatomy, okay? And how these disorders are going to present because if you're reading the question stem and it tells you the anatomy, you can really rule out a lot of stuff. So um, for acute pancreatitis, this patient is going to be presenting with epigastric pain that's going to radiate to the back. That's usually pathognomonic for acute pancreatitis. Okay. They're also going to be having um, nausea and vomiting. They're going to be very ill appearing when you see them. They're going to be anorexic. They're going to have fever. They're going to have leukocytosis. They're going to be uh, tachycardic, hypotension. Uh, they have abdominal tenderness, decreased bowel sounds. They can also have signs of like hemorrhagic signs. Like make sure that you're familiar with this. This is very, very high yield once again. You we have our colon sign, which is basically that umbilical ecchymosis, okay? So colon sign, how I think about it is like Edward Cullen, for those of you who are um, fans of like the vampire movies. Um, so colon sign, Edward Cullen, periumbilical. And then you have the your uh, Gray Turner sign. So it's going to be the flank sign. It's going to be on the flanks. For those of you who are fans of Gray's Anatomy, Dr. Gray. So Gray Turner sign, flank sign. And then... Fox sign, it's going to be in the groin area, groin ecchymosis. So make sure that you know that. They might show you a photo and they'll tell you or they might describe it. So once again, colons is going to be periumbilical. We said that great turnout is going to be in the flanks. And then we said fox sign is going to be in the per in the uh, groin area. So groin ecchymosis for this. So how are we going to diagnose this? Usually it's a clinical diagnosis. We do a CT scan to confirm and then on the labs, what we're going to see is that we're going to see increased serum amylase. This is the most common one we're going to see. So make sure that you're reading the question stem very carefully. If it asks you what's the most common one that we're going to see increased, it's going to be amylase, okay? Is it specific? No, it's not because amylase can be increased in everything. Amylase can be increased in orchitis. It can be increased in mumps, right? So amylase is not very, very specific. What's the most specific one? It's going to be lipase so make sure that you know that and how the question is going to ask you because they try to trick you like that if it asks you what's the most common one it's going to be increased amylase what's the most specific it's going to be lipase okay so um treatment for this is going to be supportive right we want to make sure that we are giving them fluids bowel rest we are correcting their electrolytes because most of these patients are going to be hypocalcemic they have decreased calcium so we want to make sure that we're giving them their calcium or monitoring it also. If it's very severe, then we're going to admit them, okay? Uh, prognosis is going to be with the Ransons criteria, okay? So make sure that you're familiar with this. I actually just had a question on this on Saturday, and I missed it. I was very mad. I thought I had it down, but I guess not. So for the Ransons criteria, they have to have three out of the four. So they have, uh, basically, they have to have... Um, uh, age, their age has to be greater than 55, white blood cells more than 16,000, glucose more than 200, LDH more than 350, and then AST more than 250, okay? If they have more than three of these, then it's going to be, you want to monitor them in the ICU. All right, guys, so now we're going to go into chronic pancreatitis. So we talked about Q. So remember we said for acute, the most common causes are going to be what? It's going to be your gallstones and your alcohol, right? This patient's going to be presenting with your epigastric pain that radiates to the back. They can present with ecchymosis, which is like bruising. Periumbilical is going to be what? Periumbilical is colon side, right? right? Edward Cullen. How I memorize it is that, you know, there's a part where, I don't remember which movie it was. Um, so basically, he he goes out and he's like lifting his shirt up because he thinks that, uh, his, I forgot his girlfriend. It's been a while since I see these movies. His girlfriend is dead. And he's gonna like go out, and I think he was commit suicide. He basically lifts his shirt upright, and he's like all sparkly and stuff like that. And that's how I memorized it. So periumbilical colon sign, and then you have your flank sign, which is gonna be your uh, Gray Turner sign, and then you have your ecchymosis in your inguinal area. That's gonna be the Fox sign, right? Treatment is usually supportive. We're gonna give them IV fluids, pain medications, okay? And basically, what is acute pancreatitis? It's basically it's the pancreas is just auto-digesting. It's uh, destroying itself by its own enzymes. So chronic pancreatitis is going to be persistent inflammation. So this patient has had so many bouts of acute pancreatitis attacks 
that it just becomes fibrotic. So you have this fibrotic tissue, you have um, strictures and dilation of the ducts, and it's irreversible. So what is some of the causes? Chronic alcoholism is the most common cause of pancreatitis, okay? How's this patient going to present? They're going to have chronic unrelenting pain with flare-ups. They're going to have that same epigastric pain that radiates to the back, right? Nausea and vomiting, pain that's worse with drinking and eating. They'll have steatorrhea, right? They're going to have these symptoms already where the pancreas isn't just not working anymore for these patients. Um, treatment diagnosis is usually a CT scan. That's going to be basically our initial test of choice. We are going to do an ERCP also, this is gold standard, but it's invasive, like we said. Um, so we tend to stick to the CT scan. Once again, make sure that you're reading the questions. So if I ask you what's the gold standard, ERCP, what's the best initial test, and it's going to be a CT scan, okay? Treatment, we're going to give him pain medication, uh, nothing by mouth, right? We're going to give him um, insulin, tell him to stop drinking alcohol. But usually surgery is going to be what's going to relieve the pain. So we're going to do a pancre pancreato jejunosomy. That's going to be the most common one or pancreatic resection. All right, guys, next one is going to be pancreatic pseudocyst. Basically, this is a circumcised collection of fluid that contains pancreatic enzymes, blood, and tissue outside of the pancreas, okay? So the cause is of this is basically the patient's going to have a history of acute pancreatitis, and it tends to occur, um, basically, it tends to occur with these patients weeks after they had an attack of acute pancreatitis, okay? This patient's going to be presenting with dull abdominal pain, epigastric abdominal mass. Also, they'll have nausea, scleral icterus. Also, uh, diagnosis, we're going to diagnose with a CT scan with contrast, and we're going to see a well-circumscribed fluid collection. This patient's also going to have increased amylase and lipase, uh, bilirubin, and LFTs also. But the treatment for this is usually supportive care. Most of them tend to go away by themselves. Um, we can give them like PPIs, but uh, usually, like I said, it's supportive care. They go away by themselves. Um, you can do a pseudocyst endoscopic drainage if needed, but that's usually like second line. And then third line is like surgery, but that's if it's necrotic. But like I said, first line is just supportive treatment. They tend to go away by themselves, Okay. And usually with these patients, they're going to be presenting with circumcised collection of fluid um, that you'll see. They'll have uh, an epigastric abdominal mass, and then they'll have a history of just having like a acute pancreatitis attack, okay? And we're going to diagnose it with a CT with contrast. So that was the pancreas. So why don't we go into our hernias? Hernias are very, very highly tested. So why don't we go into each one, okay? So basically, what is a hernia? Hernia is a defect or weakness in the muscular or fascial layer of the abdomen that allows tissue to exit a space it's normally contained, okay? So once again, it's basically a defect in the muscular layer of the abdomen, okay? Usually due to weakness, okay? So we have different types and like I said, this is very highly tested, so I'm going to repeat whatever I kept seeing on the exam when I was taking it. So we have our direct inguinal, we have our indirect inguinal, we have our femoral, our incisional, or ventral, and our umbilical, okay? So let's go into each one. So direct inguinal, make sure that you know the anatomy for these also because this is very, very highly tested. So we have direct inguinal, which is basically a defect of be a defect of the transversalis fascia in the Hesselbeck triangle, okay? So direct is going to be very commonly found in your middle-aged or elderly male, okay? So that's how I memorize it, basically D, old dudes. That's how I memorize it. Direct, usually found in older males. And with this one, medial, it's going to be medial to the inferior epigastric vessel. That's where it's going to be anatomy-wise. Make sure that you know that, okay? So direct inguinal, it's due to a defect in the transversalis fascia in the Hesselbeck's triangle, and it's medial to the inferior epigastric vessels, okay? The Hesselbeck's triangle, basically, what is it composed of? Medially, it's going to have the rectus sheath edge, and then laterally, you're going to have the inferior epigastric vessel, and then inferior, you're going to have the inguinal ligament, okay? So that's going to be your direct inguinal hernia, okay? How I memorize it is that I memorize it by um, 
MDs uh, don't lie. So MDs is going to be medial direct inguinal, so medial to the inferior epigastric vessel, MD, medial direct, okay? And then for lie was going to be lateral indirect epigastric um, vessel. So your indirect inguinal, this is one that's going to be found more commonly in younger individuals. So we said direct, right? Old dudes. Uh, indirect inguinal is going to be a deep inguinal ring, uh, usually due to, uh, is usually found in the process vaginalis. It's congenital, and this one's going to descend in the scrotum, okay? Once again, indirect is going to descend in the scrotum, commonly found in younger individuals, okay? It's going to be found lateral to the inferior epigastric vessels. Remember, MDs don't lie. Uh, medial to the epigastric uh, vessels, it's going to be what? Your uh, direct inguinal hernia lie lateral to your epigastric vessels. It's going to be your indirect inguinal. Okay, MDs don't lie. That's how I memorize it. So once again, direct is going to be what found in older individuals, right? Dudes, older dudes. Direct, that's how I memorize it. Um, indirect, it's going to be using your younger individuals. And indirect is going to descend into the scrotum, okay? Then we're going to have femoral. So femoral is the most commonly uh, found one in women. And basically with femoral, it's going to go through the femoral canal. This one has a very high risk of incarceration and strangulation, okay? Once again, Femoral, it's going to go through the femoral canal, most commonly found in women, risk of incarceration and strangulation. It's located in the upper thigh, medial to the femoral vein. And then we have incisional and ventral, okay? This is usually due to a breakdown of the fa uh, fascial clo closure from a previous surgery or a previous site of um, surgery. So usually, like I said, incisional, ventral, if a patient had a surgery somewhere, then it's going to be there. Usually with these patients... I remember during my surgery rotation, because my doctor did a lot of hernias, a lot of them, um, we saw a lot of women that had, uh, like, for example, um, they had uh, C-sections. We saw a lot of hernias in these patients with their um, incisional hernias, okay? Usually these patients are, they have, uh, they're asymptomatic, but just know with incisional or ventral, it's usually, they'll have a previous history of having a surgery. And then you have umbilical. This one's very commonly found in children. It tends to go by away by itself. And just like it sounds, it's located in the umbilicus. And uh, we basically want to make sure that if it's been going on for more than five years and it hasn't been go going away, by, it hasn't gone away by itself, then we want to make sure that we go in there and we do surgery. So once again, direct inguinal is going to be found what? Older dudes, right? It's going to be found in older individuals. With this one, it's a defect of the transversalis fascia in the Hesselbeck triangle. Okay, so we have the Hesselbeck triangle. It's going to be what? MDs don't lie. So medial, direct, medial to the inferior epigastric vessels versus indirect inguinal. This one's commonly found in your uh, younger patients. Basically, this one's going to descend into the scrotum. We said it's going to be MDs don't lie. So um, it's going to be found where? It's going to be found lateral to the inferior epigastric vessels. Okay. And then we have femoral. This is the most common one found in women, and it's very commonly for these to strangulate and incarcerate. We have incisional and ventral. Basically, the patient will have a history of having surgery. Umbilical, very commonly found in children. It's benign. It goes away by themselves. But it's been if it's they're old, older than five and it's still there, then we want to do surgery. So what's going to be the treatment for these, okay? If it's reducible or asymptomatic, we just want to make sure that we monitor it. If it's irreducible... Then for these patients, we want to make sure that we do an NG tube, we give them broad IV antibiotics and fluids, and do an emergent hernio uh, afi, if I pronounce it correctly. So basically surgery, okay? If it's strangulated, basically these patients are going to be presenting with severe pain, nausea and vomiting. Um, they, there's going to be ischemia and necrosis with these patients. And then if it's incarcerated, these are like serious. We have to make sure that we go in there and we do... Uh, surgery. With incarcerated, they're going to be basically presenting with uh, pain, nausea, and vomiting. Uh, they'll have a firm, painful, non-reducible by direct manual pressure. Okay. Pygmonic, uh, Pygmonic, Metacomic is a cool picture. I really recommend if you can Google Metacomic. Uh, it's amazing of how these hernias on your strangulated one, there's like a hernia that's like basically like going like this to the hernia. 
strangulated it and then you have incarcerated where he's like in the jail it's awesome so just make sure that you are familiar with these okay guys so um basically once again uh reducible soft easy um you're able to put these back into place so you just want to make sure that we monitor these my roommate actually i don't have a roommate anymore because i'm currently in san antonio but um basically when uh, i was with her she showed me like she's like hey what do you think this is and she showed me and she had, she had a hernia but it was reducible because she was able to put it back in and i was like well you just i thought i'm like dude you have to observe that because you know if it gets worse you're gonna have surgery because it can get incarcerated so reducible you're able to push it back it goes back by itself and then you have incarcerated which is firm and painful it's not reducible by direct uh manual pressure and then you have strangulated these are really really bad so these are basically painful due to impaired blood flow. These become ischemic and necrotic. Okay. Sorry, my classmates are messaging me. We have a group me. And they're always messaging asking about uh, things that are due. So now that we're done with that, why don't we talk about infectious diarrhea? Okay. I always struggle with this one. So we'll both, we'll both go through it, guys. Um, this was actually something I kept missing on my questions. So let's go through them. So we have rotavirus. So rotavirus is transmitted uh, fecal orally. Okay. With these patients, you're going to be presenting with acute onset of very watery diarrhea for 48, four to eight days. You're going to have fever also. Like I said, it's transmitted by fecal oral. Uh, usually the treatment for this is going to be supportive. And usually with these patients with rotavirus, it's commonly found in daycares and children. That's why we do the vaccination with this for rotavirus, okay? So pediatrics, daycare, usually it'll say that they have a yellow-green diarrhea. Next one's going to be norovirus. But this one, it'll say cruise ship, okay? Uh, this one's also transmitted fecal-oral. The patient's going to be presenting with nausea and vomiting, diarrhea, the fever, myalgia, abdominal cramps. Foods associated, it's going to be shellfish if the, uh, there's infected individuals handling the food also. And treatment is going to be supportive once again. So the buzzword is going to be cruise ship for norovirus. Next one's going to be salmonella. So with salmonella, it's going to be transmitted with food, uh, especially like eggs, also fecal oral. The patient's going to be presenting with a gradual abrupt onset of diarrhea. They're also going to be presenting with fever with these patients okay um also they're going to be presenting with blood in their stools the foods that are going to be associated are going to be eggs uh, poultry milk cheese juices raw fruits and veggies diagnosis is going to be with fecal leukocytosis routine stool cultures also and treatment is basically you don't really give them antibiotics unless it's they have a systemic infection and it's gone systemic then that's when you would give a fluoroquinolone and with these patients with salmonella, usually the buzzword is going to be poultry or pork. Next one's going to be Shigella. This one is fecal oral also with these patients. Uh, with these patients, so you have to know that with Shigella, they're going to have blood and pus, okay, in their stool. And it's usually abrupt onset. They're going to have cramps, tenesmus, fever, also lethargy, okay. Uh, diagnosis, we're going to do a fecal leukocytosis. And treatment is basically, um, we can give them fluoroquinolones, but we want to make sure that we don't give them no any opioids, okay? Because this can cause like something like toxic megacolon, okay? But it tends to go away by itself. Staph aureus. So with this one, the buzzword is going to be picnic, egg salad, potato salad. Um, the patient's going to be presenting with abrupt, intense nausea and vomiting for 24 hours. So they're going to be vomiting a lot. They won't have any fever. The foods that are associated, like we discussed, your potatoes, your chicken, your mayonnaise, your bakery products, your ham, okay? And then treatment's going to be supportive for this one. And then you have enterotoxin E. coli, transmitted through food and water. With these patients, you're going to have a history of traveling, like traveling to Mexico, for example. They're going to have water or diarrhea, abdominal cramping also. Uh, foods associated with this is going to be food, or, food, water, contaminated with feces. You want to do a stool culture. And then you can give them a fluoroquinolones for this. Next one's going to be the bad E. coli. So we have different types of E. coli. E Enterotoxin E. coli is not really bad. That's your traveler's diarrhea. And then we have our E. coli 0157 or 0157. Um, this one is bad. 
This patient is going to be presenting with abrupt bloody abdominal pain. Um, it can cause TTP, so thrombocytopenic. Uh, uh, it can cause TTP. And fever also, these patients are going to be presenting. Um, in adults, it usually tends to go by, away by itself. But with children, it's associated with hemolytic uremic syndrome. Okay. Usually what you're going to see is that the buzzword is going to be um, they're going to have undercooked beef, hamburger, milk, juice, raw fruits, veggies. Um, treatment for this is antibiotics. You actually do not want to give them because it can increase the risk of hemolytic uremic syndrome. So if patient has a hemolytic uremic syndrome, we want to make sure that we're giving these patients plasma exchange. Okay. Buzzword is going to be hemolytic uremic syndrome usually. And then we have cholera, vibrio cholera. So with these patients, uh, the buzzword is going to be your rice water stools. Or sometimes I read a question that it said like stool that had like flex in it. So rice water stools, um, shellfish, flex, like I said. Um, with these patients, um, they're basically going to have this like liquidy diarrhea. These patients can die because they become so dehydrated because they're so losing so much fluids in their diarrhea. Um, they're going to be presenting with fever. It's usually abrupt. Usually on the question stem, it'll say a patient that traveled and they came back. Most of these, that's how they present. And usually it's due to contaminated water, shellfish, uh, street food. You want to make sure that you do a stool culture on them for diagnosis. And treatment is usually going to be IV fluids because remember I said these patients are having like really bad diarrhea, so they're losing a lot of fluids. fluids. Um, you also want to give them their electrolytes because if they're diarrhea, what are they going to have? They're going to have metabolic what? Acidosis, right? Metabolic acidosis. So you want to make sure that you're correcting that, giving them IV fluids. You can also give them tetracyclines and azithromycin for it. And then we have Clostridium difficile, C. difficile. So this is usually going to be present in a patient that just finished taking an antibiotic or a regimen antibiotic. Which one's most commonly associated with your C. difficile, okay, um, or your colitis? It's going to be your clindamycin. So usually it'll say the patient was um, taking antibiotics like clindamycin or they were just taking antibiotics. So the patient's going to be presenting basically... Um, with abrupt bloody fever, toxic megacolon also. And like I said, the medications that are going to be associated is going to be your clindamycin, your fluoroquinolones. We want to make sure that we test the stool for the toxin. And treatment is going to be oral metronidazole or oral vancomycin if it's severe. Okay? So oral metronidazole if it's moderate or mild. And then oral vancomycin if it's severe. So next one's going to be intamoeba histolytica. So this is like a liver, this is a fluke. So this is transmitted through fecal oral, food and water. Patient, if they have mild symptoms, they're going to have loose feces, stomach pain, and cramping. They can also present with amoebic dysentery, which is basically severe bloody stools that have fever, stomach pain. And with intamoeba histolytica, this can actually go to the liver. It can cause an abscess and can even go to the brain and lungs. That's gross, right? With these patients, we want to make sure that we do a stool analysis and then treatment is going to be metronidazole. Next one's going to be another parasitic infection. I love parasites. Giardia lamnia. So this one's going to be fecal oral, um, most commonly usually in food water. Usually the question stems is that the patient was like, they went on a camping trip or they were on the river and they drank water. Okay. Um, this patient is going to be presenting basically with watery abdominal bloating. Um, also, they won't have any fever. They'll have these like foul, like uh, foul, very greasy stools, like they have oily stools. They're foul smelling diarrhea. We want to make sure that we check this stool for um, oocytes and parasites, right? OMP. And treatment's going to be metronidazole also. Okay. All right. So now we're going to keep going into our food poisoning. So be serious. Bacillus serious. This is associated with rice. So reheated rice. Um, also certain pastas. These patients are going to be presenting with diarrhea. Usually in the question stem, it'll say that they had like a... Um, they reheated some fried rice and then they got diarrhea. So be serious, bacillus serious. Uh, Clostridium botulism also, this is going to be from canned food, okay? Um, so diarrhea, they're going to be presenting with diarrhea. Also Clostridium perfrigens, which is going to be 
reheated meat, okay, or canned foods also within 24 hours. They're going to have watery diarrhea and epigastric pain. And then we said uh, staph aureus, right, which is our mayonnaise, our uh, eating meats, okay, they're going to have abdominal pain and uh, diarrhea, Yersinia, also pestis, undercooked pork, diarrhea with Yersinia. Also, this patient can present with like pseudo appendicitis also. Okay, so <clears throat> now that we've discussed these, let me just make sure that we've discussed all of them. We're going to go into food allergies and sensitivities. So food allergies and sensitivities, okay? So let's start with celiac disease. It used to be known as sprui. Now it's known as just celiac disease. Um, it's, and although, although I know a lot of some doctors that still call it like sprui. So it's due to, what is celiac disease? It's an abnormal mucosa due to a reaction with a, basically an antigen against um, a gliadin in gluten. Okay. Uh, these patients are sensitive to anything that contains gluten. So you're like your wheat, your rye, your barley, your oats. Okay. Um, it's autoimmune. It tends to damage the duodenum also. Usually with these patients, they're going to be uh, more commonly found in females. This patient's going to have a family history also. Usually it also says that they'll be of European descent and also it has HLA uh, association. How's the patient going to present? They're going to have diarrhea, steatorrhea. Remember that we discussed that whenever you read a question stem and it talks about steatorrhea, we are thinking about anything that is associated with some type of vitamin. Uh, they have an absorption problem. We're not able to absorb vitamins. So this is where, this is the case, lactose intolerance. So these patients are going to be presenting, I'm sorry, uh, celiac disease. These patients are going to be presenting with your um, steatorrhea. They're going to be presenting with uh, distension, bloating, anemia also. They're going to have vitamin deficiencies. They can even have osteoporosis, okay? They're going to have easy bleeding. This is because they have vitamin K deficiency. Also, something that's very commonly associated with celiac disease is your derma uh, dermatitis herpetiformis. So this is very, very commonly associated with celiac disease, dermatitis herpetiformis. How are we going to diagnose this patient? We're going to do serology, serology tests. So we're going to do our IgA anti-tissue transglutamase and then IgA anti-endomesial antibody. We're also going to do, we can do a biopsy of the small bowel. Where we're going to see flat villus atrophy, descript hyperplasia with lymphocyte infiltration. We also want to make sure that we're checking their vitamins, right? Because these patients are um, usually, they have malabsorption. And uh, treatment's basically going to be a dietary consult. We want to make sure that they are basically eating a gluten-free diet, okay? They're taking iron, calcium, vitamin D, and folate supplements, okay? And this is associated with an increased risk of intestinal lymphoma. So what you need to know about celiac disease is that, once again, it's an autoimmune disorder, okay? I totally missed this on a question. I had it on an EOR so you, that's your end of rotation for your clinical year. I don't remember which EOR it was, but I was so upset and I had put that initially and I changed my question. It gave you a vignette. You knew it was celiac because the patient was having these symptoms whenever he ate like anything that contained gluten. And then it asked you what it was the cause and it listed and I didn't choose autoimmune. It's an autoimmune cause, okay? And another thing that you need to know is that with these patients, you're going to do an IgA anti-tissue transglutaminase and then an IgA anti-endomesial antibody also, okay? All right, guys. And then also you want to make sure that this is associated with dermatitis or pediformis. So the patient can present with that also on your question stem and that's you're like, uh-huh, it's cilia. So the next one's going to be lactose intolerance, which is basically where the patient has lactase deficiency. Okay, it tends to affect the proximal small intestinal mucosa, uh, very commonly found in uh, individuals that are Asian. So like 90% Asian, 95% uh, if they're Native Americans also. Also very commonly found in patients that have short bowel syndrome or if they have malnutrition. How are they going to present? They're going to present with bloating, abdominal cramps, flatulence, osmotic diarrhea if they drink a lot of uh, whatever had lactase like milk. Uh, lactose, sorry. Diagnosis is going to be with your hydrogen breath test also. 
And then treatment is going to be basically telling them to stay away from lactose. So lactose-free diet, okay? You can also give them lactase enzyme replacement, like lactate also. These patients are at increased risk for osteoporosis, so make sure that you are educating them to take vitamin D and calcium supplementation. So next one's going to be our nut allergy. This is IgE-mediated. It's an IgE-mediated IgE reaction to peanut, tree nut, and seeds. Okay. Usually this patient will have a family history. They might even have allergy to eggs. They'll have atopic dermatitis and eczema. As you can see, these are all like allergic reactions, like autoimmune reactions. How is this patient going to present? They're going to have urticaria. So they're going to have also pruritus, angioedema, okay, which is like the inflamed like um, lips. Um, they'll have dysphagia, shortness of breath. They can develop anaphylaxis if they're having that dysphagia and shortness of breath. Uh, they'll have sneezing. They can have numbness and tingling also when they feel like the onset is coming of the allergic reaction. Diagnosis is usually clinical. We can do an IgE antibody test, like a skin prep test, which is going to be positive. Okay. And basically treatment is that we want to tell to a patient to avoid it, right? And then we want to make sure that we educate them on having that EpiPen ready. Okay. Having that EpiPen and where to insert it, insert it into their inner thigh whenever they feel like they're going to have like an anaphylactic shock and these patients know, okay? So now that we've discussed that, what do we go into our nutritional and our vitamin uh, disorders, okay? So let's start with vitamin A deficiency. Basically, vitamin A deficiency also known is also known as retinol. This is the leading cause of preventable blindness in children, okay? And it also increases the risk for infections like measles. It's very commonly found in patients that are malnourished also. And then also if the patient has cystic fibrosis, if they have celiac or any type of malabsorption or malnutrition like we discussed where they're not able to absorb those vitamins. How is the patient going to present? Once again, we said it's the number one cause of vitamin A deficiency of blindness. So they're going to have ocular uh, signs. They're going to have xerophthalmia. They're going to have night blindness, okay? Um, they might have also xerosis of the conject, uh, conjunctiva or cornea, ulceration or corneal scarring. They'll have follicular hyperkeratosis, which is um, sandpiper-like skin, uh, immune defects. Treatment is basically going to be supplementation. Where do you get your vitamin A from? You get it from your green leafy veggies, your carrots, your sweet potatoes, liver, kidney, milk, eggs, yolks. Just know that vitamin A deficiency, okay, also known as retinol, is associated with uh, eye problems, blindness, especially like your, your night blindness. It's the number one preventable, um, basically, uh, blindness in children, okay? And we want to make sure that where are we getting this from? Green leafy veggies, uh, kidney, milk, eggs, yolks, sweet potatoes, and carrots. And these patients that have vitamin A deficiency are more prone to getting infections like measles. Next one is going to be thiamine, vitamin B1, okay? Make sure that you know that. I had a question, and I knew it was thiamine deficiency, and I go to the question stem, and it says vitamin A, B, C, D, E, and then I'm like, crap, I just memorized vitamin, uh, thiamine. So thiamine is vitamin B1. Make sure that you know that. They're going to trick you like that. So vitamin B1, thiamine, okay? What happens with these patients, or what is where is this thiamine, vitamin B1, most commonly associated with? Or what I think about whenever I think about vitamin B1 deficiency or thiamine deficiency is going to be chronic alcoholism, okay? Chronic alcoholism is very highly associated with vitamin B1 deficiency. Also, if the patient is uh, starvation, right, if they had bariatric surgery, surgery or any type of malignancy also, how are they going to present? Basically, we have, remember, our dry beriberi and then we have our uh, Wernicke Korsakoff syndrome. Okay. And these are usually found in alcoholics, right? So dry berry berry, they're going to have peripheral neurological deficits. Okay. They'll have bilateral, uh, stock and glove distribution. They'll have muscle wasting also in dry berry berry. Now Wernicke Korsakoff syndrome, they're going to have encephalopathy, psychosis, confusion, ataxia, nystagmus. Make sure that you know this. I had a question on this for sure. Vitamin B1 deficiency, Wernicke-Korsakoff, okay? 
Wernicke encephalopathy and Korsakoff psychosis, confusion, your ataxia, your nystagmus. And then also wet beriberi. This is usually associated with cardiovascular problems. I actually got pimped in this in clinic two weeks ago and I got the answer wrong. So they're going to have myocardial disease because of vitamin B1 deficiency. They're going to have tachycardia, sweating, warm skin, heart failure, orthopnea, pulmonary and peripheral edema, shock. So once again, vitamin B1 deficiency associated with alcoholics, right? All right. Next one's going to be thiamine. Uh, Sorry, we already went over thymine. Niacin deficiency, also known as vitamin B3. Once again, make sure that you know not only niacin, but it's vitamin B3 because it can trick you, like I said. So niacin deficiency is vitamin B3, also known as pellagra, okay? So this is a water-soluble vitamin. Usually with these patients, um, how is this patient going to present you're going to have signs and symptoms of pellagra, raw skin, and then the four Ds, right, are diarrhea, dementia, uh, dermatitis, and death if the patient's not treated. So once again, four Ds, diarrhea, dementia, okay, uh, dermatitis, and then death with uh, pellagra. They can also present with weakness, photosensitivity, inflammation of the mucous membranes, um, dysphagia also. Treatment, of course, is that they're going to have to Make sure that they're having proper intake of niacin. This is going to be done via meat, fish, liver, whole grains, green leafy veggies. Okay. So next one is going to be vitamin C deficiency, also known as our ascorbic acid. Okay. Most common cause of scurvy. Um, infants whose mom's diet was, this is commonly found in scurvy, <clears throat> in infants whose mom's diet was vitamin C deficient or infants who were fed unsupplemented evaporated milk. How is this patient going to present? They're going to have pseudoparalysis. They're going to have peripheral edema, swelling or bleeding of the gums, uh, petechial hemorrhages, bone tenderness with swelling, impaired wound healing. Usually in the question stem, the ones that will jump out to you that will say it's due to vitamin C is going to be your impaired wound healing if they have swelling or bleeding of the gums, Okay. Usually if it says that anywhere in the question stem, I'm like, oh, you know, it's vitamin C deficiency, also known as what? Ascorbic acid, because it can trick you like that. Uh, diagnosis, we want to do an x-ray. On these patients, we're going to see ground glass appearance, okay? Treatment's going to be with supplementation. Of course, we're going to tell them to take vitamin C from their citruses, like your oranges, um, spinach also, liver, kidney. Seems like liver has everything, right? I don't like liver. Cauliflower, adrenal cortex. All right, so vitamin D deficiency is going to be the next one. Vitamin D deficiency is associated, it's responsible for rickets in children and osteomalacia in adults. Make sure you know this. I had a question like a few months ago and I still remember it because I was fighting with my classmates over the answer because um, we were taking a quiz and we were fighting and I was like, it's this one. And they're like, no, it's this one. And I was like, you know what? This doesn't occur in elderly. And I got it wrong. Osteomalacia is vitamin D uh, deficiency in older people. It exists, guys. I got it wrong. So osteomalacia, um, usually in older individuals that I remember the vignette perfectly. It was an older male. And they were presenting with the symptoms of um, basically vitamin D deficiency, which I'm going to discuss. And Vitamin D deficiency was an answer and I didn't choose it. I chose like osteoporosis and it wasn't that. So vitamin D deficiency in older individuals, like elderly, is going to be osteomalacia. Vitamin D deficiency in younger um, children is going to be rickets, okay? Vitamin D is also known as calciferol. So make sure that you know that because it can trick you once again. And they won't list vitamin D, they'll put calciferol. And you're looking for vitamin D and you're like, oh, I don't remember what it was. So what are some of the causes? Breastfed infants, um... If the patient is a vegan, if they have any type of malabsorption disorder, okay? Also, if they're taking certain seizure medications, if they have reduced sunlight exposure also, okay? Sunlight exposure gives you vitamin D. Go out and play outside. So um, how is it going to present in infants? The patient is going to present with seizures, tetanus, these symptoms of hypocalcemia, right? Okay? Um hypotonia, failure to thrive. They'll have wide cranial sutures, frontal bossing, cranial tapes also. If the patient is older, then they're going to be presenting with pot belly, bow legs, 
kyphosis, uh, delayed dentition, wide wrist, rachitic rosary, okay? And treatment's going to be basically prevention. Um, in infants and children, we want to make sure that we're giving them vitamin D for these patients, like uh, in cheese, liver, sunlight. So going outside and playing, not only staying inside and playing video games, okay? And uh, we want to make sure that we also correct the calcium and phosphate levels also for these patients. So that was vitamin D deficiency. Make sure that you know them. So just to go over them real quick again, vitamin A deficiency, right, also known as retinol, is associated with night blindness, especially blindness in children, okay? Thiamine, vitamin B1 deficiency, right, vitamin B1. Usually when I think about an alcoholic, we have our Wernicke korsakoff syndrome, okay? Uh, niacin deficiency, vitamin B3. We have our pellagra. We have the four Ds, right, which was, uh, let's go through them. It was uh, diarrhea, derma diarrhea, dermatitis, it was death, and then I forgot the fourth D, dementia, okay? And then we have vitamin C deficiency, also known as sorbic acid, okay? With vitamin C deficiency, we have scurvy, right, which is going to be the your gingival bleeding, your mucosal bleeding. These patients are going to be presenting with poor wound healing also, pseudoparalysis, bone tenderness. And then we have vitamin D deficiency. We have rickets in children, which is associated with the bull legs, right? We have also um, osteomalacia in older patients, and it presents usually with symptoms that can mimic hypocalcemia. This is why I got it wrong. Tetany, okay? Seizures. These patients have reduced sunlight exposure. Okay, guys, so let's go to ingestion of substances and foreign bodies, okay? So foreign body is a patient has an inability to swallow without regurgitation. They can't swallow saliva, um, basically with a foreign body. Um, <clears throat> very commonly found in small children because they like to put everything in their mouth, right? How is the patient going to present if they have a foreign body? They're going to be presenting with drooling. Basically, also they have problems breathing. They'll be wheezing and coughing, okay? They'll have dysphagia trouble swallowing, odinophagia, painful swallowing. If they ingested a coin, usually they're asymptomatic. We want to make sure that we do an x-ray, okay? And then if they ingested a button battery ingestion, button battery, this is an emergency because this one actually can go and cut through the esophagus and through the tissue and can cause an upper GI bleed. I remember when I was during my surgery, res my surgery residency, my surgery rotation, I was with some residents and I was sitting in the room with them and they got called to an emergency. It was a child. She had swallowed a button battery and she ended up dying, unfortunately. Um, this is an emergency. This is severe. It can perforate within four hours. So with these patients, you want to make sure that you find the type of battery and you, re you retrieve it endoscopically, okay, with an endoscope. So how are you going to diagnose these patients with foreign bodies? We're going to do usually a clinical diagnosis if they're presenting with the symptoms that I listed that I talked about. But usually with the chest x-ray, we're going to see the foreign body. Okay, we're also going to do an endoscope. Treatment is going to be endoscopic retrieval. Uh, bronchoscopy if it's near the airway. Usually with small objects, they will usually pass if it's not a battery. But usually with small objects, they're going to pass by themselves. And if it's in the stomach, we really don't have to go and get it. Okay, you're usually going to let it pass, but the only ones that we want to be careful with are going to be sharp objects because these can actually perforate the GI tract. Um, corrosive objects, like I discussed, because these can actually perforate also the, um, the GI tract. Okay. All right, guys. So now that we've discussed that. Let's talk about toxic ingestions. I'm just going to discuss each one and basically what is the antidote for each one, okay? So let's talk about our tricyclic antidepressants or TCAs. So the antidote for that's going to be sodium bicarb. Opioids, it's going to be naloxone, okay? I'm going to be going over the ones that I saw very, very commonly. Acetaminophen, antidote is going to be N-acetylstine. Anticholinergics, it's going to be fesostigmine, uh, fesostigmine, okay? Aspirin, sodium bicarb, beta blockers, glucagon, or insulin. What about a benzodiazepine overdose? We're going to give uh, flumazenil, okay? Um, heparin, we're going to give protamine. 
So those are the common ones I've seen. So why don't we go now into our neoplasms, so our cancers, okay? So esophageal cancer, this is very commonly found in men more than women, and usually commonly found in individuals that are smokers. Um, they drink alcohol, very commonly found in regards to ethnicity-wise, African-Americans also. And <clears throat> there's different types. So we have squamous cell and then we have adenocarcinoma. So squamous cell is very commonly found in African-Americans. And usually with squamous cell, it's going to be found in the upper mid-esophagus. So make sure that you know your anatomy. So we have squamous cell is going to be upper in the upper two-thirds of the esophagus. And then adenocarcinoma is going to be in the lower one-third of the esophagus. That's how you're going to be able to differentiate each one and also with what they're associated with, okay? So we said that squamous cell is going to be the two upper two-thirds, very commonly found in African-Americans, very commonly found with those that have alcohol or tobacco use, okay? They drink alcohol or tobacco use. Squamous cell is very common. Once again, upper two-thirds, okay? Then we have adenocarcinoma. This is going to be the lower one-third, okay? This is very commonly found in individuals that are Caucasians. Also very commonly found in patients that have a history of gastroesophageal reflux disease, history of Barrett's esophagus or H. pylori infection, okay? And like I said, this is going to be found in the distal one-third of the esophagus. So make sure like you know your anatomy, like I said, okay? And that we said that Barrett's esophagus is usually a complication of long-standing gastroesophageal reflux disease. Remember we discussed that earlier? So Barrett's esophagus, what happens is that you have columnar metaplasia to the squamous epithelium. So you have squamous epithelium that lines the esophagus. And since you're having this acid basically going up and just rubbing against the esophagus and it's Coros it's causing like corrosiveness and it's destroying the tissue, it's going to become columnar metaplasia. And this is where you have had, you develop Barrett's esophagus and then you can develop gastric cancer, I'm um, sorry, esophageal cancer. So which one? Your adenocarcinoma. So once again, squamous cell, upper two thirds, smoking, African Americans, alcohol abuse, lower one third, adenocarcinoma, GERD, H. pylori, Barrett's esophagus. How is this patient going to present? They're going to have dysphagia. They're going to have trouble swallowing. Okay. They're also going to be presenting with weight loss. Whenever I think about weight loss in a patient, it always brings a red flag to me because I'm thinking that's more something more severe. Also, they're going to have painful swallowing. They can present with hematemesis, right? Weight is hematemesis or vomiting bright red blood. A hoarse voice also because if the mass is so big, it can actually compress the laryngeal um nerve and it can cause this hoarseness i actually so during my didactic year once again in my cadaver lab we had a patient that had um we're assuming that they had the patient the cadaver patient had passed away from having um, esophageal cancer because he had a huge like can't like, growth on his esophagus it was humongous okay so What's going to be the diagnosis with these patients? Basically, the diagnosis with these patients is going to be, we want to start with an initial uh, barium swallow, okay? We're going to see an apple core lesion, and then a definitive diagnosis is going to be endoscopy with biopsy to see what type of cancer it is, okay? And then we can do a CT scan to see basically uh, how, if it's spread anywhere, and to stage it. Treatment is usually, whenever we diagnose these patients, it's advanced. So we want to make sure that we do a surgery. Basically, we're going to do an es esophagectomy. And usually with these patients, they have a very poor prognosis. They have about a five-year survival rate, unfortunately. They tend to metastasize to the liver, lungs, and bones. So what you need to know about esophageal cancer is that these patients are going to be presenting with trouble swallowing uh, um, solids, okay? And it's not going to be something that has been going on for a while. It'd be something acute, like I said. They're fine today, and then next thing you know, next week, it's like they're, they have full-blown, like, we discussed the previous disorders, right, that they're having trouble swallowing. This is progressed, like, it's been going on for a while, like, okay, it was solids, 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 and then liquids, liquids. But this one, it's like solids and then liquids all of a sudden within a very short amount of time, okay? And these patients, that's what we want to think about, adenocarcinoma, if they have weight loss, okay? Like I said, remember, make sure that you differentiate between adenocarcinoma and squamous cell. 
we said that adenocarcinoma is usually where in the lower one third, squamous cells in the upper two thirds. Squamous cells is associated with alcohol, um, smoking, very commonly found in African Americans. We said that adenocarcinoma usually is associated with Barrett's esophagus, GERD, H. pylori, Caucasian. So make sure that you know that. So gastric cancer. So this is stomach cancer, right? It, the most common type is going to be adenocarcinoma. It's very commonly found in uh, older individuals if they're older than 70. And interestingly, it's very commonly found in Asia, especially if they're at Japanese and uh, Chinese descent. So it's very, very commonly found in Japanese and Chinese. I know it used to be like the number 15 cancer here in the U.S. I don't know about now, but it's very commonly found in Japan, though, in China. I think it's like number one, or number two for the cancers causes. So uh, risk factors for gastric cancer are going to be smoking. If they eat a lot of preserved foods, like your dried, smoked, salted foods. If they have a history of gastritis, like your H. pylori infections, um, pernicious anemia also. This patient is going to be presenting with abdominal pain, also weight loss. Remember when we talked about weight loss, that's also always like a red flag for us. They're going to be presenting with low appetite, anorexia, dyspepsia. They're going to be feeling very full soon. Uh, postprandial fullness, nausea and vomiting. They're, when we think about that it's metastasized already, this is very, make sure that you're familiar with this, this is very high yield, is that you want to look for your virtuose nodes, which is your palpable left supraclavicular node, okay? Left supraclavicular virtual node or your umbilical lymph node, your sister Mary Joseph node. So this is associated with gastric um, carcinoma, Okay. Another thing that's associated with gastric cancer that I found very, very interesting is that whenever we think about our velvety, right, that velvety hyperpigmentation that presents in the back of the neck, we see that it's an uh, acanthosis uh, nigricans, right? We see this and then we're like, oh, that's diabetes, it's insulin uh, resistance. But no, this is actually also associated with gastric cancer, which I found very, very interesting. So I just wanted to um, basically just share that with you guys. But um, like I said, suggestive of metastasis, you're going to have that palpable supraclavicular virtue uh, lymph node or an umbilical lymph node, your sister Mary Joseph lymph node, okay? How are we going to diagnose these patients? We're going to do an endoscopy with biopsy. This is going to be the most accurate test to diagnose the cancer. And then we want to make sure that we also are looking at the CEA tumor marker also. Treatment's going to be with surgical resection, Okay. All right, so now we're going to go into colorectal cancer. This is the third most common cancer in the U.S., and it's a very, very preventable cancer if patients go and they get their screening done, okay? So basically, the most common type is going to be adenocarcinomas, and they tend to ha arise from adenomas, okay? Where does it metastasize? The most common site it metastasizes is the liver. Make sure that you know that you're definitely going to have a question on this. I definitely did and I missed it. So liver is going to be the most common site where it, it metastasizes it. Okay. So what are some of the risk factors for a patient that's colorectal cancer? If they have a family history, of course, if they're older than 50, it's more um, commonly found in patients that also have um, adamant, if they have a family history of any type of polyps, right? adenomatous polyps, um, if they have a really bad diet, they're eating a lot of fats, they don't eat a lot of fiber as they should, they smoke a lot, they're obese, okay? So what are the signs and symptoms? Usually if it's early, they're asymptomatic, but they present with melina, they can present with hematochoesia. So melina is that dark, right? That dark, um, those dark uh, blood stools. Hematochoesia is going to be that bright red blood. And then they're going to be presenting with abdominal pain. They're going to have change in bowel habits also. Weight loss is going to be a huge red flag. Iron deficiency anemia also. So if we have a patient and we diagnose them with iron deficiency anemia and they're older, we want to make sure that we do the full workup of colorectal cancer because we want to make sure that we're ruling that out since iron deficiency anemia is very commonly associated with colorectal cancer. Another thing that you need to know is how the how the cancer is going to present, whether it's on the right side or on the left side, facing you, right side, right side or the left side, okay? So you have to make sure that you know that. So if it's on the right side, 
basically this patient's going to have blood. They're going to have iron deficiency anemia. They're going to have melina, change in bowel movements also. They're going to have weakness, okay? Um, but change in bowel movements is not very common as in right-sided as it is in left left-sided tumors, okay? So left-sided tumor is going to have more commonly change in bowel habits, okay? Right lower quadrant mass also. So once again, for your right-sided, you're going to have blood. You're going to have iron deficiency anemia. You're going to have melina, okay? And then we have our left-sided tumors. These patients are going to be presenting with obstruction and change in bowel movements. So this is more commonly found with change in bowel movements in patients that have left-sided tumors, okay? They're also going to have pencil stools, pencil stools, which makes sense, right? If you have that obstruction, you have that stool that's really, really small because it's not able to go through, pass through. So how are we going to diagnose these patients? We're basically going to do a colonoscopy, okay? This is the most specific test to diagnose colorectal cancer. We can do an x-ray also. On the x-ray, we're going to see that apple core lesion. And then we're going to do also lab work. What are we going to see on lab work, we said? We're going to see iron deficiency anemia. And also, they're going to have increased CEA. It seems like CEA is increased in anything that is uh, GI-related, right? Because we said that CEA, CEA tumor marker was also used for gastric cancer. So we want to make sure that we're educating these patients on screening because this is very, very preventable cancer if the patient is getting screened. So we want to make sure that we screen them um, starting at age 50 and then after that every 10 years. If the patient's at high risk, then we want to make sure that we do it at five years, right? So if they're at high risk, um, you want to screen at age 40 or 10 years prior to the relative diagnosis. So say if a patient has a um, family member that passed away or was diagnosed at age 45, then we want to diagnose them 10 years prior to that, okay? So treatment's going to be surgical treatment. Um, this is the only curative treatment. So we're going to go in there and resect the area that contains the tumor, okay? We want to make sure that we're also monitoring the CEA levels for these patients, um, preferably every three to six months to see if it's increasing or decreasing. And like we said, the most common site for uh, metastasis is going to be the liver. So let's go into hepatocellular carcinoma. So this is going to be a cancer of the liver, right? The most common cause is going to be which type of hepatitis did we discuss? We said Hepatitis B, right, and C, especially if hepatitis is, is uh, you have the super infection with B and D. But hepatitis B and C is, are very commonly associated, the most common cause of hepatocellular carcinoma. Carcinoma. So what are some of the risk factors for hepatocellular carcinoma? Cirrhosis, hemochromatosis, Wilson's disease, patient smokes cigarettes, diabetes mellitus type 2. The patient's going to be presenting with abdominal pain, hepatomegaly, um, Weight loss, anorexia, portal hypertension. Remember, we discussed the signs and symptoms of uh, cirrhosis, jaundice, splenomegaly. We're going to diagnose this patient initially with an abdominal CT scan, but the definitive diagnosis is going to be with a liver biopsy, okay? And we want to make sure that we are also monitoring their alpha fetal protein because they're going to have an elevation of alpha fetal protein. Alpha fetal, fetal protein, okay? Treatment is going to be basically, we want to make sure that we are getting rid of whatever the low, if it's only to a lobe, we're getting rid of that lobe of the liver. If it's the entire liver, then we have to make sure that we get, um, we get rid of the entire liver. And then we're going to do transplant and chemo radiation, okay? So next one's going to be cholangiocarcinoma. Uh, this is very commonly an adenocarcinoma. It's very commonly found in elderly and basically, it's a cancer of the intra-extra-hepatic bile ducts. So once again, this is going to be a cancer of the bile ducts. It's associated with gallstones. It's associated with parcelling gallbladder also. And it's also, also associated with the parasite clonorchis sinensis. Um, you might have a question on this. I think I had one. So this is a type of um, fluke. So clonorchis sinensis, a type of parasite. Also, with a cholangiocarcinoma, um, these patients are usually going to have a porcelain gallbladder. They'll have basically intramural calcification of the gallbladder wall. Okay. 
Signs and symptoms, they're going to be presenting with jaundice, biliary colic, weight loss, anorexia, right upper quadrant mass. They'll have a palpable gallbladder, okay? They'll have obstructive jaundice, uh, dark urine, clay-colored stools. They'll be very, very itchy also. Diagnosis is going to be with a cholangiography also. And treatments, it's very hard because most of these are not resectable. So we might have to do with these patients a cholecystectomy versus a radical cholecystectomy. So it depends. And prognosis, it's most of these patients tend to die within the first year of diagnosis it's because it tends to go undetected until it's been advanced. So next one we're going to go into is going to be pancreatic cancer. So pancreatic cancer. Um, what you need to know about pancreatic cancer is the anatomy. So we have the head, we have the um, body, and then we have the tail, right? So it's like this. So the most common area of cancer with pancreatic cancer is going to be in the head. 75% is found in the head, okay? So it's going to be found in the head. Some of the risk factors for uh, pancreatic cancer is the patient is a smoker, if they're diabetic, chronic pancreatitis, if they drink a lot of alcohol, and it's very commonly found in African Americans. This patient's gonna be presenting with abdominal pain, they're gonna have jaundice, weight loss, anorexia, weakness, they're gonna have migratory thrombophlebitis. This is pathognomonic for pancreatic cancer, it's gonna be your migratory thrombophlebitis. This is also another one that's gonna be pathognomonic for um, pancre uh, pancreatic cancer, it's gonna be your curvosure sign, which is gonna be a palpable gallbladder. Diagnosis, we're going to do an ERCP. This is the most sensitive. And then um, we're also going to look at their tumor markers. So which tumor markers? CA199, that's associated with pancreatic cancer. We can also do CEA, but CA199. Treatment is going to be basically resecting the area that has a cancer, like Whipple's procedure, okay? And prognosis, they have very, very poor prognosis, unfortunately. These patients tend to die within months once they're diagnosed with pancreatic cancer. Okay, guys, so let's keep on rolling. So let's talk about acute GI bleeds, okay? This is an emergency, okay? Huge emergency. So let's differentiate between an upper GI bleed and then a lower GI bleed. Make sure that you know this anatomy point, the ligament of trite. So the ligament of trite is going to tell you whether there is an upper GI bleed or a lower GI bleed. If there is bleeding above the ligament of trites, that's an upper GI bleed. If there's a lig if there's bleeding below the ligament of trites, it's going to be a lower GI bleed. Make sure that you know this. Once again, ligament of trites, it's going to be your, ana your anatomy, okay? So it's going to upper GI bleed. So once again, we said this is what? Above the ligament of trites, okay? So what are some of the causes? We have uh, peptic ulcer disease, erosive esophagitis. Mallory Weiss tear, esophageal varices, we have NSAIDs, aspirin, clopidogrel, anticoagulants that can cause these upper GI bleeds. Um, how is this patient going to present? They're going to be vomiting blood, hematemesis, right? That bright uh, coffee ground blood. They're going to have melina, um, which are black tarry stools. Basically, it's old blood. It's telling you that it's from the upper GI, okay? Diagnosis, we want to do an upper endoscopy, okay? Uh, we want to do a gastric lavage treatment. It's basically going to be with, um, we want to make sure that we do coagulation of the bleeding vessel. And then if it keeps bleeding, then we're going to do um, endoscopic treatment or surgical intervention like ligation. So what about a lower GI bleed? We said that's going to be below the ligament of trites, right? So with the lower GI bleed, we want to think about colorectal cancer. We want to think about that colorectal cancer once again. We also want to think about which other ones did we discuss? Diverticulosis, right? They're having that bloody diarrhea. We want to think about also um, ulcerative colitis, hemorrhoids. So what are going to be the symptoms for these patients? You're going to be presenting with um, hematochoesia, which is going to be that fresh, like right, bright uh, blood through the anus. And we're going to do a diagnosis with doing a colonoscopy for these patients, okay? Treatment, it can stop spontaneously um, if it's due to like something like diverticulosis, just support it, right? Educate the patient to increase their fiber and their diet fluids. Um, 
we want to make sure that we rule out colorectal cancer, right? So if we see any type of polyp, we want to make sure that we get rid of it also. And then overall, for any type of GI bleed, we want to make sure that we're doing a stool guire for a cold blood. We want to make sure that we're doing a CBC to look for any type of anemia because we said iron deficiency anemia is associated with what? Colorectal cancer. We want to make sure that we're looking at their coagulation, uh, look at their PT, PTT, INR, look at their liver function, their renal function. Um, for exams, if we think it's lower GI bleed, we're thinking it's anything that do with the anus and we want to do an anoscopy also. Make sure that we're not, we're excluding any type of rectal um, source. We can also do an arteriography. This will tell us the area that's bleeding, um, a colonoscopy that we discussed. And then usually like our last, last result, like we cannot find the cause of the GI bleed. We want to do, go in there and do a, an exploratory, explorative laparotomy. Okay. What's going to be the treatment? We're basically going to do our ABCs, airway, breathing, and circulation, right? Making sure that the patient is okay. We're going to give them IV fluids because these GI bleeds, these patients can die from them. And then transfusions if needed. And then, of course, treat whatever is the underlying cause. If it's an esophageal varus that ruptured, make sure that we're treating that. Okay, so the next topic is going to be our pinworm infections or pinworm infections. These are very, very commonly found in children. What is a pinworm, also known as, or the pinworm called its name? It's uh, Enterobius vermicularis. Make sure that you know that because if you just memorize pinworm on the exam, you're like, okay, I know what that is. It's pinworm, and then it's going to show Enterobius vermicularis. So make sure that you know that. So um, we have our pinworms, Enterobius uh, vermicularis. With these patients, they're going to be presenting with anal itching that's worse at night, very commonly found in children. We're going to diagnose it with a scotch tape test, okay? And treatment for this is usually like mebendazole or albendazole. This is very, very highly tested, so make sure that you're familiar with this. Why do they, why is it more commonly, why is the patient more itchy at night? Because that's where they, that's when they come out. And you know, kids put their hands in their mouth a lot, so they're scratching their butt and then they put their hands in their mouth, they're auto-inoculating themselves. Okay. So now we're going to talk about jaundice, just jaundice overall. Make sure that you know and you're familiar with jaundice. I got pimped on it left and right for my pediatric rotation because it's very commonly found in children. And usually in children, it's a benign if it's like a newborn infant, but we'll discuss it. So jaundice, basically, it tends to be more intense in the upper body, and it's not as intense in the lower extremities for jaundice. There's several causes of jaundice, like we discussed. It can be the patient has hepatitis. It can be they have some type of biliary disorder, right? Even if they have some type of like blood disorder, like hemolytic um, anemia, for example. So what we want to talk about is bilirubin. So we have conjugated and unconjugated. If it's unconjugated or indirect, basically that, that means that it's insoluble. It has trouble being excreted. If it's conjugated direct bilirubin, it's soluble, and this one can be excreted, okay? So... If you have a patient that presents with jaundice um, in days two to seven, okay, we want to think about physiological jaundice, okay? Basically, the baby is getting used to their body. And then we have a hemolytic disease of the newborn, where basically there's production or placental transfer of maternal anti-RH antibodies from RH negative mom to RH positive baby. So they're having all these blood cells that are basically... Birthing. Pop, pop, pop. And that's why they're releasing all this bilirubin, and that's why this patient is becoming jaundiced. And then we have kernicterus, which is basically where you have unconjugated bilirubin that goes to the brain, and it can cause brain damage and death because unconjugated bilirubin is able to go to the brain. It's able to cross the blood-brain barrier. Um, and then we have genetic causes of jaundice. We have Gilbert and Krigler jar. Make sure that you know and you're familiar with these. So in Gilbert's and Crigler and Ajar syndrome, they're going to have increase in unconjugated bilirubin. With Dubin-Johnson syndrome, they're going to have an increase in conjugated bilirubin. Okay? So the mnemonic I have for this is Gilbert and CN are uncool, but Dubin is contently cool, right? Because uncool, right? unconjugated, cool, contently cool, conjugated. So that's how I have it. 
So we're going to diagnose these patients. We want to make sure that we look at their liver function test, right, to rule out it's anything due to hepatitis. We want to make sure that we do a liver ultrasound. We want to make sure that we looked at both total direct and indirect bilirubin to see if it's maybe like a hemolytic cause or if there's anything maybe like even obstructing the liver, like, a, um, for example, a stone that can be causing the jaundice. Um, we want to make sure that we also look at their blood, right? Do a CBC for these patients. And then treatments use your watchful waiting. Sometimes the jaundice is going to go by, away by itself and you don't need to treat it, especially if it's like newborns, if it's physiological jaundice. Okay, now we're going to go into non-alcoholic fatty liver disease, okay? Non-alcoholic fatty liver disease and non-alcoholic steatohepatitis. Basic, this is a fatty liver, okay? A fatty liver. So non-alcoholic fatty liver disease leads to non-alcoholic steatohepatitis. Usually these patients are going to be obese, they're going to be overweight, they're going to have metabolic syndrome, they're going to be diabetic, they're going to have hyperlipidemia. So what happens with these patients is that basically um, they're eating they're eating a lot of fatty fatty things and their liver isn't able to keep up with basically trying to break all that down. So it becomes engorged with all that fat, and that's why it's called non-alcoholic um, fatty liver disease and non-alcoholic hepatitis. okay? Usually these patients are not going to have a history of being alcoholics, okay? So with non-alcoholic steatohepatitis, um, they're going to be presenting with basically steatotosis that's complicated by hepatocyte death and and inflammation, lipotoxicity. So how are we gonna diagnose these patients? We're gonna see LFTs are gonna be increased. They're gonna be increased on multiple occasions. So we wanna make sure that we do a liver ultrasound, but our definitive is going to be a biopsy, okay? Basically the liver is gonna be very, very stiff, we're gonna see. And then treatment's gonna be, make sure that we're educating the patient on their diet, making sure that they're exercising, um, but usually if it's end stage, it's usually going to be liver transplant, okay? So next one's going to be hemochromatosis. So hemochromatosis is an autosomal recessive disorder, and basically it's a problem with iron absorption, okay? Basically, they have excessive iron absorption in the intestine, so they're accumulating a lot of the iron as ferritin and hemosiderin in the organs. So... The affected organs, the most common one that's going to be affected, it's going to be the liver, but it can affect a lot of things like the pancreas, heart, the thyroid. Um, the patients are going to be presenting, usually they're asymptomatic, but if they do have symptoms, they're going to be presenting with fatigue. They'll have arthritis, impotence, amenorrhea, abdominal pain. They'll have cardiac arrhythmias. So they'll have hyperpigmentation. So they'll look bronze-like. And diagnosis is going to be with genetic testing. We can also do an ALT and AST, which are going to be a little bit elevated, not very highly elevated, but we're going to confirm with our iron studies and our liver biopsy. And treatments, usually basically we want to make sure we're doing a lot of phlebotomies. That's usually the treatment of choice for these patients. And if it's advanced where like their liver is completely like shot, then that's when we're going to do a um, liver transplant for these patients. So what about Wilson's disease? So I always get these confused between Wilson's and hemochromatosis. So hemochromatosis is due to um, excessive iron absorption, right? Versus Wilson's disease. This is an autosomal recessive disorder that involves copper metabolism. So this patient has an impairment of copper excretion. So they're not able to excrete copper. So they're accumulating all this copper in their liver cells. It goes into all their organs into the plasma. So how's the patient going to be presenting? With liver disease, we're going to have acute hepatitis, cirrhosis. They're going to have Kaiser Fleischer rings, which are going to be the yellow ring in the cornea. That's usually pathognomonic. They'll give you a picture and um, it'll show Kaiser Fleischer rings, which are going to be yellow ring in the cornea. If it goes to the brain and it involves the brain, they can present with uh, central nervous system findings like resting tremors, rigidity, bradykinesia, chorea, even drooling, um, incoordination, personality changes, psychosis. So for those of you who are Dr. House, watch Dr. House. I know I've, I've like talked about his name several times, but for those of you who watch Dr. House, there's an episode with a patient that actually has Wilson's disease. And the patient was presenting like a schizophrenic um, and 
the patient was not responding to any of the treatment for schizophrenia. And it's because the patient didn't have schizophrenia. They ended up having uh, Wolfson's disease. And like it says, it presents with symptoms of psychiatric disorders. So it presents with your um, psychosis, like it says. So just make sure that you have it in the back of your mind. If there's anything in the question stems that says that the patient is not responding to uh, any type of antipsychotics, you want to think about maybe your Wilson's disease. And also, it's interesting because they diagnose the patient by basically bringing a, 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 an eye exam and they looked into the eye and they saw those uh, um, Kaiser Fleischer rings. Okay. How are we going to diagnose these patients? We're going to do basically a liver biopsy and we're going to see elevated copper concentration. And we're going to treat with collating agents. So something like penicillin. Okay. So let's go on to metabolic disorders and then we're almost done. So we have phenylketonuria, also known as PKU. This is an excessive phenylalanine due to failure to properly metabolize it. So basically, they have a deficiency or absence of the enzyme phenylalanine hydroxylase, which converts phenylalanine to tyrosine. So these patients are going to be presenting with eczema. They're going to be presenting with hyperactivity, seizures. They're going to have this musty odor. This is pathognomonic for phenylketonuria, okay? It's going to be a patient that presents with that musty odor. Um, they're... This can also result in mental retardation if it's not treated. And this is why we test babies for it. I don't know if you're familiar or you've heard of the PKU test. This is what we're testing for, okay? And then with these patients, like I said, we're gonna, this is why we do the newborn screening test. Uh, how are we going to diagnose them? We want to look at their plasma, phenylalanine, and tyrosine levels. Basically, they're going to have decreased tyrosine, okay? And then their PKU is going to be increased. Uh, treatment is basically we want to make sure that they have dietary restriction. We want to give them tyrosine. We want to tell these patients to avoid high proteins and phenylalanine. Okay. All right. So bariatric surgery is going to be the next one, which is going to be our weight loss surgery. This is usually used in patients that have a BMI more than 40. And these patients have not had success losing weight with diet and even medications. Okay. So we have different types of bariatric surgery that you can do. We have our sleeve gastrectomy, which is the most common one. This is removal of the greater curvature, smaller stomach. And these patients basically feel fuller quickly. And then we have our gastric bypass. This is usually the gold standard. They do this in the root and Y procedure. And it basically decreases the stomach holding capacity. But... The thing about these bariatric surgeries is that they have a lot of complications. So that's why you have to make sure that you're educating these patients and you have to make sure that you're closely following after they have these bariatric surgeries because they have a lot of complications. Um, my doctor was telling me about a case because he was telling me how he doesn't very, he doesn't really agree or believe in bariatric surgery. Everyone has their own opinions. So he was telling me about a patient that he saw um, the patient wanted bariatric surgery, so went to go see a bariatric surgeon and then was never educated on how to properly eat afterwards. And then the day after her surgery, she went, got Whataburger and she ate a lot and she ended up dying. So that's why we want to make sure that we're monitoring this patient, educating them what and what they cannot eat, especially after surgery. Why? Because of what I'm going to discuss right now. Dumping syndrome. So dumping syndrome is a post gastrectomy syndrome that is due to destruction or bypass of the pyloric sphincter, okay? Basically, there's rapid emptying of chyme. This patient's gonna be presenting with nausea and vomiting, cramps, diarrhea, flushing, diaphoresis, palpitation soon after eating meal high in fats and carbohydrates. How are we gonna diagnose this is that we wanna do basically, um, it's gonna be a clinical diagnosis, but if we do a CBC and a CMP, these patients are gonna be hypoglycemic. So treatment for this is making sure that we educate these patients, like I said, um, uh, do diet modification, tell them to eat small, frequent meals, okay? And then usually if these patients, what happens is that they need reoperation. So <clears throat> other things that we want to consider about bariatric surgery is uh, per-surgical complications, like I said. The most common complication is going to be dehydration. These patients are also very prone to developing vitamin deficiencies. So vitamin B12 deficiency is very common in these patients. 
um, folic acid deficiency also, vitamin D deficiency, iron deficiency. So the diet, we want to make sure that on week one and week two, they're on a clear liquid diet. Week three and week four after the surgery, they have a period diet with protein supplements. Okay. And then lifelong, they just have to make sure that they have a stabilized diet. Okay. So once again, educating your patient, you want to avoid these things like dumping syndrome. So now we're going to go into our last topic, which is basically our pharmacology. Okay. So let's talk about our H2 blockers. These what they do is that they indirectly inhibit proton pump by blocking stimulation via H2 receptors on the parietal cells. They decrease acid secretion. Some of these drugs are ranitidine and cimetidine. Of course, there's a lot more. These are the common ones you're going to see. What are they used for? Remember that we discussed, even though this is not used in clinic, but textbook-wise, they're used for peptic ulcer disease, gastritis, GERD, um, Zollinger-Ellison syndrome. And then we have our protein pump inhibitors. These are a lot better than the H2. This is why we use them as first line. What they do is that they do irreversible inhibition of proton pump. They decrease acid secretion. The common ones you're going to see is omeprazole, esomeprazole, pantoprazole, and lansoprazole. What are they used for? GERD, gastritis, peptic ulcer disease, um, H. pylori also. And then we have bismuth um, or sucrophate. What they do is that they basically provide like a protection or coating of ulcer base, okay? What they're used for is peptic ulcer disease, traveler's diarrhea, H. pylori. Some of the side effects that we need to know is that bismuth salicylate, also known as your peptobismol, it causes a uh, black stool. So the patient is going to see black stools, okay? And then we have mesosprostol, which is cytoprotectant. It increases production and secretion of bicarb and mucus in the mucus barrier in a decreased hydrochloric secretion. It's used for um, peptic ulcer disease. It's also used for labor induction. And then we have scopolamine, which is an anti-muscarinic. It blocks um, M1 receptors in the vomiting center. It's used for motion sickness. And then we have Zofran, right, or Dancitran. That's a very commonly one that you give for patients that have nausea. So this one is a 5-HT3 antagonist. And what it is, it's an anti-emetic. We use it for nausea and vomiting. If the patient's post-op also, if they are having um, a chemo, then we also give them odansetran. And then we have metoclopramide. This is a D2 receptor antagonist, and it's a prokinetic. So it increases the resting tone and contractility. We use this for anything that lacks contractility. So gastroparesis, right? Uh, diabetic gastroparesis, post-op ileus also, but it's contraindicated in Parkinson's. Okay. All right, guys. So we are done with GI. Hopefully this video was helpful for you guys. As always, if I please, if I made any mistakes, please uh, leave a comment below so um, I can fix it. But please let me know. I, as you can tell, I'm still in my scrubs. So I got out of clinic and then I'm like, I need to study. So I came and I've been making this video. So sometimes towards the end, I get a little tired and then I may, may, might make some mistakes. So please let me know if I made any mistakes. Also, if you guys have any cool ways of remembering certain information that can help other students, please comment below. Or if you have cool mnemonics that we can learn that can help me also, please comment below because we all want to help each other. We all want to pass. So once again, I hope this was helpful for you guys. If it is, please give it a thumbs up or comment below if you have any feedback for me or if you guys like this video so I can keep making these type of reviews for you guys. All right, guys, I'll talk to you guys later. Bye.